talks of he talks of initiatives each of which have failed. Uh, it would be nice if you I don't know whether this will be beyond the discussion, but I think when we prepare our syllabus, the syllabus should reflect what I do today with liberal stars. What I do today with Anekanta Bhattu. Our teaching is something we knew Anekanta Bhattu, right? Generation after generation students, teachers taught it. Generation after generation students wrote it, got first class first. But only when postmodernism traveled here, arrived here, we suddenly go, oh, we had something like postmodern epistemology. We had Anekanta this gap is also something which our syllabus needs to address. This is a layman's observation, but I'm very thankful to you, the department, and I hope we will continue in such. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. The standards haven't changed much, actually. I still advise people to write six pages. <laughs> 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 At least it will give them some chance of passing. So. Uh, I'm going to invite the chief guest, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, to uh, say a few words before he starts. I will just introduce him. He is the uh, professor of the Persian Department of Persian. He is an eminent scholar with a sterling academic record of the uh, numerous distinctions he has. I will not. Uh, I will just mention a few of them. So he received the Mahavi Cultural Foundation Award from Geneva, Switzerland, uh, for his PhD thesis in 1990. This is the first ever. <laughs> just a little bit, just two things. Yeah. Oh, okay, sir, you start. I'm yeah. thankful to Professor In fact, I was surprised why I'm invited to this department. I have no role. But long back, I was born in international house. A pilot from Lufthansa who was about 64, 65 years old at that time. Joined the university, amateur oh. I asked him why you have thought about this to come to India and join the department that you said. He said, I couldn't earlier due to some reasons and now I have ample amount and now I want to study my dear subject. So we used to discuss many things. Yeah, philosophy is a heavy subject. Heavy subject. In fact, uh, we in Persian. Yeah, it is also unfortunate that we in this country have fucking departments. What lesser we interest in each other, lesser we know about the content of the curriculum we are teaching. And I believe in many departments philosophy is being taught. I am studying philosophy from the right from my first year of graduation. But it's purely one may call it Sufism, Sufism or Islam. When I was going through the survey, long way there was a Muslim professor in this department and he was the expert of Islamic philosophy after that no one has joined and it was discontinued. Yeah, as Professor said, English is the medium to study all the philosophy. It may be fortunate or unfortunate, but better we learn the languages also to know the primary source in this way. You know, to say about one language or other, in whichever the philosophy we are studying, the primary sources we read and we attach to this. So learning a language takes a lot of time, no doubt. As uh, the last, I will say, 20 years, 
we are engaged in this, we call it mafia, changing the syllabus according to the given rules. And majority, I am sorry, I am very brutal. We see our comfortable level in drafting this thing. It's not every subject, I'm not of not only of mine or that. Because after becoming permanent, as you said, there is no experience is required to become a teacher. I'm not talking about this adultism and which is going on now. They also join ADOC not for the purpose of the experience. They join on the ADOC basis not to get the experience. In number of uh, selection committees when we ask questions and ask if you are selected from tomorrow you have to teach, often the answer comes, sir I will study and then I will come to teach. How much time one get just of selection? Yeah, so this is our system where we select a teacher or we become our teacher as you said. If we are lucky, if we get the good teacher. So we should not look at only the comfortable zone of ourselves where we have to study less new books at the advanced stage when now promotions have become much easier than compared to our time. I'm not jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> but the word, the quality is given in this one, which is one of the five, as it is the five pillars of the NET 2020. Definitely, it may be on the third or fourth pillar that is counted with NET. But it should be the first one. Reason is, we are producing graduates or the post graduates of a particular subject who definitely become someone to deliver on the basis of their acquired experience on that particular subject. When we say, all oh, these young teachers are not teaching very well. Who is the responsible? The senior guy. Who drafted the syllabus and who didn't deliver them? Why we should blame them? So, given the number of periods, and in fact, uh, in the last two, three overhauling of this, education policy. There is a lesser time of teaching and more time for the other associates. And that is become debatable how much content you can keep in the system. Exactly. In fact, if I was given power, I would have said let every teacher make his own syllabus as it is in many countries. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Why I should impose a particular subject to its school? <coughs> but I know that this is despite our democratic all principles, we don't give this democracy to the student. And we mention the books in the reading list. Readable books of the other type of but how many students read other books? That is the thing. But definitely we should mention. The other way is to have continue this kind of a seminars. Promotion should be given to the seminars of the students rather than some senior come and deliver lecture and students remain engaged in the mobile. 
<laughs> so I would just suggest that we should not look at the comfortable zone during summarizing the syllabus, both of the graduation and post-graduation. Definitely the time constraints are there. Expectations are known. And we should compare what percentage we are adding to the previous series. Have we divided the old syllabus or we have added certain? Additions also should not be at the comfortable. There should be some percentage, even if it is 5 percentage, 5 percent, should be some new phenomena. Definitely in philosophy, because philosophy is a subject where, because like in madrasa, I go back to my subject. Earlier we used to study Ibn Arabi and Allah Matabadza by Iranian philosophy. Because in our curriculum we say philosophy creates two things, logic and rational. And both were strong at the Madrasa level teaching. Now they don't teach philosophy. They call it Islamic philosophy. Hmm? They call it Islamic philosophy and then they have chosen some specification. Even Ibn Arabi is not being taught as it should have been. The term we use it, Radhatul Vajud. They prefer to teach Radhatul Shafi. Especially onwards, at the time, the more emphasis was to teach this subject and we have studied many of these subjects. So give the students at least some freedom if they can study some sources at their own to find out what is the rationality between the present day philosophy and the past. I can suggest three names if people can get some material, otherwise I will be able to provide. One is on Sufism's main part. In the one region called Mirza Abdul Qadir Bedi. His combination of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. Prior to that, only Molana Rune's philosophy was there. Molana Rune, Vedil explained it. He added Hinduism and more Buddhism. Uh, Rune's poetry do have Buddhism because he was from Baruch and Afghanistan area and later on migrated to Turkey side. Vedil remained born and brought up in India and buried also in India. Third becomes Iqbal, who is more in France with the Western philosophy. So these three especially, and also study Mirza Ghalib. There is a philosophy of everyday human thought. How things change. So, because when we give such things to the students, from theory they become to, to the practical side. So, if you can address some material on this uh, your curriculum, it will some add on quality. One thing, Professor Kishav. Mention about this very edition course. When we look at some 
offered from the university for the project works. I'm not criticizing here, I have criticized in some other meetings also. First is the science, second is the commerce and social science, and third the humanities, where we lie, the least modern one. And I question the number of students in all total humanities subjects are more than the first two. But when the, you offer any kind of financial support to the humanities students or teachers, it is the least one. So why do you expect that they will create some marvelous thing equal to that? Will we accept it? And that's why I asked Aditya. We should write a protest letter. Why we should put at the bottom one? Equal work, we speak about the equity in this NEP 22. And when certain things are coming, we are at the last one. However, I'm not giving any political color to this, but I feel bad when such thing for the promotion, knowledge-based promotion, is also discriminatory. The discrimination creates problems. I will stop rather than wasting your more time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we have uh, changed our syllabus to the extent that uh, at least there is some uncomfortable stuff in it. So, at least in almost every uh, course. So, at least some new things have come in. So, maybe more should come in. So, we'll work on that. So, uh, I will now request uh, Professor R.P. Singh to deliver the keynote address. I'll just say a few words about him. He's had uh, 44 years of teaching experience. He's right now the visiting professor in uh, JNU. Everyone knows him here. So. He has supervised 50 PhDs oh and 25 God. MPhils. <laughs> that must be some kind of record in the humanities. <laughs> that deserves it. So he has to his credit 20 books and about 180 articles. Uh, his specializations include German idealism, postmodernity. German idealism is actually quite uh, rising in research nowadays. So uh, he works on all kinds of issues as a matter of fact, especially also on methodology as well. So, uh, without wasting any more time, I will uh, uh, request Professor R.P. Singh to deliver his keynote address. No, it's all right, it's all right, yeah. Is it working? So, so it's still good morning to everybody. It's 11.45. And uh, thank you, Professor Keso, for taking up this challenging task of curriculum uh, pedagogy and the quality assurance in philosophy. I thank you and uh, I thank uh, Professor Nilanjan also for inviting me to this event. In fact, uh, uh, when I talk to Professor Keso that what do you expect from me to give some kind of reflection on? He suggested that the most, most confusing term is the philosophy itself. Yes. So what is philosophy? And uh, how do we float the concepts and uh, critical thinking, pedagogy? These are the you know, basic things, and, uh, but still we need to have some kind of a reflection on it. So some of the issues which have come up uh, in the inaugural session, and uh, my fellow speakers, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar and, uh, and Professor Amitabh Ji, and uh, we have done, we've already opened up. And Professor Kesha Kumar has uh, given us the whole background that what are our expectations, how large the area is, and uh, how to begin with. So we all know that we are in the semester system, and semester system puts a lot of constraints. 
and then we have a credit based on your teaching credit means how many hours you are going to give in the classroom with the students and everything and you don't do a cumulative evaluation pattern your term paper and then sessionals and then the end semester examination it's not like that you take the examination once at the end of the year how much you have reached to the students so you know some sort of a, a kind of inter subjectivity has evolved between teacher and the taught and the student and uh, lot of constraints our syllabus is floated so that to we can we can manage our thinking our ideas our discussions our courses and everything within the time frame university is like a big lab in which we are testing all our ideas but there has to be a system of testing those ideas you know there is a time limit for it there are textbooks which are available to us so all my life i taught at jnu only and there we first appoint the teachers and then on the basis of his or her specialization they float the courses and then the course is approved at different levels various levels are there at the central level at the school level bos academic council ec and then it is floated and the floating of the courses is also something is meant for the students of the center itself and some courses are meant for the other students from other disciplines so that there should be interdisciplinary kind of exchange of ideas so we always look for interdisciplinarity interdisciplinarity multidisciplinary approach kind of a thing so this this is the way that we started doing and of course we used to have the syllabus also and the syllabus is to be modified and that's a good thing healthy spirit of modifying it developing it all the ideas need some kind of development change so what uh, i have thought of doing is that i'll just float some of the ideas about it most of the things are already known to you to to everybody so these are very limited ones and the time is also the constraint so within uh, 25 to 30 minutes i have to complete it so the first thing is that what is philosophy and we generally know that philosophy is conceived parochially on an international scale it is a subject that means different things to different continents different countries different universities different minds there is no one philosopher there is no one philosophy in fact also so you go anywhere uh, you know there is some kind of philosophy or the other so the idea came to me that uh, everything is not philosophy like if there is a water here it is h2o then h2o is not a philosophy but if i say that this is a holy water from ganges philosophy begins because you have done something now which has to be contested some bad you know jalp or bitanda has to emerge some arguments have to come up to defend it so if the concept is something which is contested there is some discrepancy in the concept you have justice a notion of justice for instance then the question is what is it to be just that can be contested on the basis of which you can evolve the theories of justice philosophy begins so if there is any contestation anywhere so that means uh, everything is not philosophy but everything can be contested in a certain manner second feature is that philosophy is a foundational subject i uh, you know there are three subjects which are very foundational ones philosophy history and uh, mathematics so without history you cannot understand any of the ideas uh, around us you need a historical background of it to understand it even to understand history you need philosophy because philosophy is the foundation of history also at what time and at which place and with what kind of value narrative something has evolved and mathematics without mathematics you can understand any of the sciences in the in the science subjects you need it and the foundation of mathematics is also philosophy <coughs> laws of contradiction and how with addition you you, you elevate the notions and you go to you know some kind of quantitative changes qualitative changes you know all that stuff laws of contradiction and everything so that also becomes foundational so philosophy is one of the foundational subjects so i think philosophy should be compulsory ones uh, i remember professor uh, 
So Pori was the vice chancellor of GA. Anyway, he said philosophy should be made compulsory to everybody all across. Let everybody Sensitive. understand it, argumentative, foundational subject. Without which mm -hmm. you just cannot do anything. You need it for history, for uh, everything else. So in economics also, equilibrium, you cannot understand without philosophy. And teachers, they give, you know, 10 lectures. I was a student of economics also for two years. And then 10 lectures they gave on equilibrium, but nobody could understand it. It's only those who had philosophy background, they could understand it. Education also, you know, everywhere you find that this foundational subject, you can go on. Now in India, we use darshana, Indian philosophy also. Professor Keso said that you must speak about Indian philosophy also a little bit. So darshana and uh, then uh, philosophy, science, some of the terms are there. So it is uh, often mistakenly th thought to be very abstract and unworldly kind of a thing as if it has got very little or nothing to do with our world of science and mm. sense. My submission is that the distinction between abstract and concrete, between common sense and science, and uh, these are the distinctions, in, you know, simply a matter of degrees, not of the kind. So the world of experience may be studied in details and also under aspect of some principles and laws. While philosophers, generally speaking, use terms uh, like concepts and categories, scientists prefer such expressions as laws, theories. The categories of philosophy and the laws of science are instantiable. It has to be exemplified, concretizable. So there are two ways of doing philosophy. One is to create dichotomies. You know, the way that it happened in the West, you can see the picture, Plato and uh, Socrates, uh, Aristotle, you know, that uh, school of Athens. So Plato's fingers are down as, and Socrates' fingers are up. That philosophy begins from, if you, you know, Plato's are up and Arist Aristotle is down, yeah, kind of a thing. It, it comes from the ideas or it comes from the matter. So some kind of, you know, uh, dichotomizing ability is required and it started with Plato and Aristotle and it continued till Immanuel Kant. After that Hegel made certain changes into it and then a lot of things started happening after it. So dichotomies between one and many, form and matter, universal and particular, potential and actual, you know, there are, there's a list of it. But in India we have got integral approach. You know, so the distinction between fact and value uh, this is uh, not at all found in Indian tradition of thinking. So in any system of uh, philosophy that we have, so even in the tribal culture also we don't find it. Fact, value, dichotomy is not at all there. So in the regional philosophies during Bhakti movement, so nowhere did, do we find it. So the distinction between norms and facts has never been a major concern for uh, in India. It is essentially Western thinking. It is because of the fact that most of the Indian systems of thought uh, do not draw a fundamental distinction, uh, demarcation between practical, theoretical reason and practical reason. All reasons are practical ones. So you take up any system of thinking, Buddhism, Vedanta, Sankhya, Nyaya. So we find there is strong reasoning about it, but then there is a you know, very serious concern about the value, the normative, all the narratives are value loaded. See, in whatever form it is there. So fact value dichotomy or dichotomy of any kind, rationalism, empiricism, immanent and transcendent, so not at all there. We are all, you know, what uh, K. Sachidananda Murthy used to say, that we are st standing in two words, tisthat ubhay asthane, sandhi asthane, between transcendent and the immanent kind of a thing. This is, that is the Upanishadic teaching also. Samhita and Mimansha could be taken up as uh, some kind of a way of, uh, you know, understanding it. And uh, Daya Krishna used to take uh, Shilpa and Smriti also as, as a complementary to it. So, and, uh, you know, this way. So, because uh, uh, pluralism is an act of philosophizing. Ekam sadvi prabhavdha badanti. Pluralism has always been there and it has been there, you know, in all the systems of thinking and also the regional philosophies and even in the tribal philosophies also, all subaltern philosophies, 
they all have dis have discourses on pluralism panchatantra also the you know applied philosophy and, uh, and you know everywhere we find that this kind of pluralism is there very strongly which has been placed there in now i come to my main issue that is concepts you know professor keso also emphasized a lot on concepts and theories principles which are there in philosophy and then critical thinking you know that is important component of it and in the nep 2022 that i'll come gradually so uh, philosophy generally in indian tradition it is called darshana darshana means seeing and showing you can see it you can see it be, you know with the help of your senses language and everything else you can show it with certain pramanas so seeing and showing are two important you know key terms with the help of which we can unpack the notion of darshana so what are the fundamental concepts like uh, substance causality etc and uh, then how are they formulated on the basis of pramanas how many pramanas are there pratyaksha anuman shabd upmana you know different systems have taken up different uh, you know labels of pramanas and they have organized it in a certain manner in order to defend their you know concepts and theories which are there now uh two more issues i i would like to place because uh, we are having a global idea of philosophy so one which was defined by aristotle long back that for him there is a substance that is subject and the rest of the concepts are predicates nine predicates which can be added to it and then you have a comprehensive picture of it so that means uh, concepts are the predicates of the subject yeah so this kind of a idea he had it predicate is always an individual entity and uh, concepts are generally thought to be universal ones and because problem of universal was there with socrates and plato because they thought that there are one, there is one thing there are many things how to understand them then socrates proposed that they let there be universals so within universals you have one and and uh, many together and that will resolve the problem this is how they thought about it and then uh, but it was not properly articulated by him socrates uh, aristotle said that you know individuals should be the subject or entity and uh, predicates should be the universal ones after a fairly long time christian wolfs also he thought uh, on the same line of the way uh, aristotle has th had thought about it that upon what and how is knowledge predicated uh, that how and what kind of questions is started coming up so what kind of a concept and how it is to be used to a particular uh, entity sub subject but the important transition came up with immanuel kant <coughs> what kant did he raised the question in a certain manner that uh, rather than asking how a concept defined by a predicate to a subject kant asked when is a concept defined by a predicate to a subject temporality came up very strongly so kant shifted the question concerning concepts to a to an issue concerning time so you to transcendental schema which kant had floated in the critique of pure reason there are four functions of time as internal intuition which will schematize it and if something is not schematized then it becomes only a thinking kind of a thing uh, not knowing uh, kind of an entity this was uh, later on taken up by heidegger also very heavily and uh, foucault also played very important role in formulating this kind of a notion yeah so but temporality became very important you know aspect of uh, time concept in the concepts formulation of concepts now how the conceptual framework is organized in the critical thinking you know at what stage like if you are uh, now the nomenclature is completely changed with the 22 20, 2022 formulation of nep 
you will not have BA, BSc, BCom kind of, you know, faculty of arts, faculty of science and all that stuff. So that will all break down now. You will have, uh, you know, multiple uh, choice kind of a thing. So it will be graduation and post-graduation and it will all be very much integrated kind, kind of a thing. And uh, there you have to use critical thinking that how much should go for the certificate level and then, then to the diploma level and to the degree level, to the research level. And then it should go to MA that the left for one year course. So here you have to be make a, a very strong critical choice so that the concepts are not uh, repeated and also not, uh, you know, overburdened. So it will, as a professor has suggested, that it, it should re require a week-long discussion on it. Because uh, given the time constraint in the semester system, there is no laser or pleasure of teaching kind of a thing. You are constrained. So you have to come and you have to finish. There is a, in all kinds of things and plus all kinds of democratic activities like strike and band and everything. You have to take into account everything, you know. All eventualities are also there. So, so here, uh, people are naturally inquisitive, so they often come up with questions about things they see or hear, and they often develop issues, ideas, hypotheses uh, about the things they uh, things which are on their way. Critical thinking is that which makes philosophical thinking specific and distinct. So, from others, it begins with the urge for an inquiry or framework of thinking, darshana, philosophy. So what are the basic categories that you will use for critical thinking in philosophy? So uh, critical thinking and critical theory are two different ones. Critical theory which started around 100 years back, you know, 1922 at the University of Frankfurt and then during Second World War it went to Europe also because of the anti-Semitism in Germany and uh, in Columbia University, Berkeley University, and uh, Herbert Marcuse was very fond of, you know, making it so popular in the U.S., you know, then critical race theory came up, you know, critical feminist theory started coming up, and all kinds of critical theories, you know, th these days people are doing it a lot about uh, even a, a critical, you know, caste theory is also there, because they're borrowing it from that hierarchy kind of a thing. So, which Marcuse had done in in U.S., uh, particularly saying that uh, just as in Marxism you have uh, uh, have ones and the have nots, and the relationship between them based on economic uh, distribution and uh, production and everything appropriation. So there is one class exploiting the other one, and there is a dominance, you know, of the uh, bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So, in in the U.S. Uh, he changed the nomenclature. He thought that the blacks are the one who are oppressed. Whites are the, are the one who are oppressors. But the rest of the mechanism he wanted to float the same way. Only the, in the nomenclature he changed it. And then the critical theory, in fact, uh, they had changed it during 22, 30s and uh, early 40s also in the, in Fra at Frank Frankfurt, Horkheimer, Adorno, Mark Buse, you know, even Lacan was also involved into a lot of people, you know. And uh, then critical th race theory came up, then critical gender theory, and uh, then, uh, you know, certain organizations like uh, left and Islam and uh, the blacks and, uh, and all the people coming together philosophizing. That's a very complex. I'm not going to do that, that stuff. I'm talking about critical thinking that we can do in philosophy. Then what are the concepts and categories that we require for thinking? So here, I've floated around five, six such categories. So first thing is that darshana, as uh, I had said that it, is, it means uh, seeing, implying, uh, subsequent seeing, that means anviksha of an object already seen uh, and presented earlier. Then critical observation, pariksha, in terms of manan, critical thinking uh, or prim uh, and that critical thinking is pri on a primarily known object, something which you know, then you will start thinking about it. And uh, so
so manan uh, and then there is a introduction of the subject uddesh and definition of an object lakshana and then critical examination pariksha so darshana has this kind of anviksha pariksha uddesh lakshana you know all kinds of you know such features are there so philosophy is very complex subject here so no longer any kind of love of wisdom so it's very much argumentative but about arguments are you know organized in a certain manner jigyasa is very important aspect for critical thinking so unless you have really desire for knowing it you cannot do it with jigyasa you you identify the object you start observing it language is also very important component of it testing it so that kind of you know the observations which are there and everything else so this stuff is going to help us a lot for critical thinking now i just want to say yeah so skepticism is very important component sandeh sanshay uh, doubt you know uh, in the west also people started with this kind of a, you know thinking doubt descartes and others uh, and pyro was also there but uh, kant we started with critical thinking kind of a thing so critical philosophy age of criticism enlightenment you professor kesar kumar talked about it so so this uh, skepticism sanshay sandeh doubt etc play very important role in critical thinking besides dialectics is also important here because dialectics will help us uh, to move the ideas from less perfect situation to something which is more perfect and this happens that we change the ideas because we are now encountering an idea which is more perfect more illuminating is something which why is it that we we start you know discussing ambedkar because his ideas are giving a much better picture of the social reality and the hierarchy which is there which needs to be unfolded examined reexamined kind of a thing so this this encounter is something which is very important one and dialectics is something which is important here so with all its features of you know contradiction and uh, overcoming of contradictions quantitative and qualitative changes and negation of negation etc unity and the struggle of opposites various terminologies are there because dialectics is very theory loaded and elevated concept of course its roots can be found in the dialogue of socrates but uh, but then gradually we have to move to something which is more theoretical aspect of it then there is another term i am very fond of using it that is deferon so there are certain concepts uh which we identify there are certain concepts with which we differentiate it from and also there are certain concepts which we postpone while formulating the syllabi again we'll encounter this kind of a situation where there will be certain concepts or theories and principles which will be, which we we will postpone it that will do it in the uh, degree level or it can be done at the certificate level or it can be done later on at the research level so you have to postpone the ideas not reject it completely you have to postpone it because if you reject it then time will come and take its revenge you know the idea will take its revenge you know there will come a time so you can postpone it so de- identifying differentiating and deferring it you know for some time so deferring is also required to understand it and then we have bad jalp and bitand of which you know we already had uh, you know some discussion on it that means uh, hearing shravan reflecting that means manan and deeply concentrated nidhi dhyasana are also important on the particular subject then repetitive enquiry jigyasa so you raise the same question again and you find that a, a new possibility is coming up that's why some of the books are called as classics one because because you read it reread it and then you find the new ideas are coming up so classic text republic is a classic text gita is a classic text kind of a thing so that means jigyasa pari prashna you know kind of a thing come not not ati prashna ati prashna is also there 
is the seed of original thinking. It is to be emphasized that no conclusion is taken to be final but only ad hoc. So it's not that if we have floated the syllabus curriculum and it's now final. No, it's all ad hoc. We'll, we'll again change it. And it should be changed. In fact, uh, different situations come up. You know, power plays very important role. War situations play very important role. Pandemic comes up, you know, and everything is uh, there to play some kind of in role into it. So we have to look at it. So how to organize it? And then pluralism, pluralistic perspective, that pluralism is an act of philosophizing. And free dialogue, egoless dialogue, sambhad, is required. You know, there was mention that sambhad is missing between teacher and the taught and the seminar discussions and everything, yeah? And uh, there is a term I have used as seeing and showing kind of a thing, philosophy is seeing and showing. So there was a time when Seeing and showing was uh, based on uh, something like uh, uh, Shruti tradition. You hear it from the teacher, Shabda Vachana, you know, Guru Vachana, Apta Vachana, Shabda Vachana. So from the Shruti tradition that you have heard of it from the teacher, from the tradition, you know, uh, that thing. But then gradually it was shifted towards manuscript tradition in particular in India and Africa, manuscript culture is very strongly there. So some of the manuscripts were stolen by the Britishers. They are bringing it back now. So manuscript tradition, and then writing and publication came up very late, I think 15th, 16th or early 17th century it came up. So with publication it became very authoritative kind of a thing. Then publisher's authority also became very important ones. and. Uh, then we have got uh, all kinds of PPTs, plagiarism, the way we are doing it in, in today's world. This is how we see, this is how we try to show it to others with all kinds of references. Plagiarism is a new phenomenon and uh, it was not there earlier. So, uh, but uh, now it, it has become part of research also. So, yeah, <laughs> we used to co copy it, but uh, you know, but then there was a 40 years ban. 40 years ban was there. After 40 years, you can own it. So that, that, that was there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I remember Dr. Karan Singh was publishing his correspondence with Nehru. So long back in 2000. Yeah. Yes. In fact, uh, there, there are, you know, from the uh, pre-Christian, Latin, and Greek, Persian, and Sanskrit texts, overlapping of ideas are there. You know, uh, th that is there, of course. Of course, plagiarism <laughs> is very old one, yeah? So, but the way it has become a component, a serious component of research, that without which your article will not even be accepted for uh, giving it to the referees. So it has to be, their thesis cannot be submitted. So this is UGC guideline about it, and we have to strictly follow it. So this has also become very important component of it. Now about the curriculum, the three, four challenges are there which we all have to keep in the mind. And I looked at the old syllabus, uh, which was very comprehensive, very elaborate. So Professor Keso was so kind enough, he sent me everything. And it took uh, three, four days for me to go through it, apparently. So very comprehensive. But there are certain uh, issues which need to be clarified. First thing is that uh, uh, the difference between graduate, uh, graduate with certificate, with diploma, with degree, and the research, uh, this is, in fact, uh, one journey. The break is there. Uh, you can take the certificate and take a break, and then uh, degree also and take a break, kind of a thing. But how long that break should be? You know, there's no, no, nobody has mentioned it. If it goes more than five years, then it becomes a, a nightmare, you know, for teacher and for also the students. Yeah. So there has to be a restraint. Yeah, it has to be a restraint. Two years, three years, three years, four years, and uh, properly it should be passed by the academic council that you cannot do it more than th this much, yeah? You know, some of my students came up, they had uh, 
deregistered, and after 20 years they came. <laughs> then Vice Chancellor said that uh, now that that topic is irrelevant. I said, no, philosophy doesn't become irrelevant so soon. It has a tendency of surviving. So if you allow, I can help the student. <laughs> So, so like uh, economics, economics become obsolete, Soviet Union collapsed, and the whole economic edifice is, you know, becomes null and white, completely zero, kind of a thing. And now this war which is going on, that will affect, you know, very many things there. So, but one has to draw a very, you know, sensible limit to it. Uh, otherwise, you know, students will be left nowhere, kind of a thing. Entry and exit points, fine, that, that is understandable because of the situation, but that exit point uh, has to be restrained, that uh, you come back, uh, you know, as soon as possible. And uh, so, and graduation courses should be, you know, floated in a way that they complement one another. Most of the things happen that we repeat the courses. This repetition has to be avoided. Because if you already have spent time, money, and energy on a particular theme, then why are you doing it again? So repetition is a kind of a thing which is to be avoided. And uh, uh, these are the two, three apprehensions that, we, uh, that I have. Some of the idealism which was there in the NEP 20, 20, 2020 and which was to be implemented in 22. So philosophical vision and uh, methodological and logistical ones, and then societal impact. So if the time is there, I can take another five minutes, Professor Keso. So about the philosophical vision, I read the draft, both it's a comprehensive one and also the short one. I don't know if you have time to go through the complete draft. So there are four philosophical themes which have been used constantly there. That is justice, freedom, equality, and fraternity. Yeah, these are the four terms which have been constantly used. And uh, the shorter version of 70 pages or 76 pages which is there, they are also repeatedly, they are trying that these are the idealisms. These are the ideals that we all have to attain. And uh, education is now regarded as some kind of a recourse. Economy is the resource. So education is some kind of capability building and uh, economy will facilitate you, you know, that kind of a thing. Earlier they had the human resource development. And humanity is not a resource, humanity is a recourse. Yeah? So resource should be other things, uh, you know, which we, which we have, the economic issues kind of a thing. And this is that's why they created Ministry of Education, you know, because it was a need at the time. So, and both education and training has to go because uh, if floating the courses, you look the way we are traveling. We are traveling from PhD level, MPhil is scrapped. Now you have six, uh, one semester's coursework, then another one semester for ethics kind of a thing. Now we are coming to undergraduation or graduation and post-graduation together because the, this is one journey which we have to travel. And then we have to go to the schools and then to the primary level and everything else which needs to be done not only the infrastructure but also the teachers training is important there because teachers have to be trained in a certain manner so uh, th so that they can cater the required kind of a thing so here it is interdisciplinary multidisciplinary kind of a thing and uh, uh, with both education and training simultaneously recognizing each student's potentialities resolving the prolonged problem of dropouts be the facili facilitating multi entries and multi multi exits. Dropout is a big problem. Actually, a, a, a IQ AC we used to do it, and they have a specific column for how many students have dropped out, and we have to find out their reasons why did they drop out. About we have to mention it there. So dropout as a problem is no longer will be there because it's the right now. They can go back and they can come back again. Both the ways they have the right to do that. So uh, this phil these philosophical concern concerns are uh, to be implemented with methodological and the logistical dimensions, which is very long one. The only thing that critical thinking is used there. Critical thinking, they have said that it should begin from class eighth 
onward. When semester system begins, evaluation, examination pattern will also come up, and then students have to make choices. For that, there should be counseling. They have to take the uh, consult from the teachers, from the parents, and there may be some voluntary <coughs> organizations also. So there should be some kind of interface between them so that the students should choose the subjects they want. And it's very longest one, you know, details of which can be sorted out. And uh, societal impact is something which I'm really very worried about it, but precisely because uh, you see the kind of uh, uh, new education policy which we are now implementing has been there in Europe for a long time, I think more than three decades. In the US also more than two decades, it has been there. So they are already 20 to 30 years ahead of us. They have infrastructure, they have the teachers, and they know how to do it. So immediately to bringing up or producing students of international scale is too much an ambitious kind of a thing. It will come, it's not impossible kind of a thing, but it will take time uh, to, to come to that. And, but uh, there is no other way out also. We have to come to that. Inviting universities from abroad, and that also uh, Indian culture has to be, uh, to, to be understood, that how much work culture is there in India. So things do not begin in time. You know, they are very time conscious people. And uh, do, do not end up in time. Again, you know, so temporality is, is to be taken into account very seriously. So this again is societal impact, and then they have said that 6% of the GDP they will spend on it, but I don't know if the pandemics and, and all that stuff keep on coming, then they will really do it or not. So that becomes, so this uh, uh, societal impact is yet to be realized. I'm not hopeless about it, but I'm definitely, you know, some, something which can be done, not very, uh, uh, the rest of the things I'll just uh, leave it. But uh, I'll come to the last slide. So ENEP 2022 is still in the process of getting properly implemented in the existing academic institutions. So we have the same institu institution, infrastructure and everything. It requires more infrastructure and training of the teachers to meet the global challenges. The students also will evaluate the teachers. So not only that the teachers are evaluating the students, that it should be two ways. It happens in other universities abroad there. So we have to be vigilant at every step besides being watchful to of situations like any pandemic, war, environmental problems and so on. We have to explore the extent to which India's knowledge system uh, is substantially incorporated in uh, 2022 implementation process of it when you are floating the courses, lest we should again get into trapped uh, of some kind of colonization of, of which Professor Keso also warned us of education of a new kind. I would like to reiterate, you know, this is a fact which I have to develop, so about the dialectics of remembering and forgetting. So how much should we remember, how much should we incorporate, what is living and what is dead, a kind of a thing. You know, th that has to be done not uh, with uh, solo thinking, but collective ones. For that we need a longer workshop and uh, see how relevant the concept is there. So I'm involved actually recently, there is a kind of a course by the Ministry, Ministry of Education, they have a part of it that are floating their, you know, book with this uh, uh, the, the philosophy kind of a dictionary of Indian philosophy kind of a thing. So glossary of Indian philosophical terms. So. So it, it will come out because many times it happens that the students give examination to the UPSC and suppose they have read my book, which somebody from BHU who is the examiner is evaluating who has not read it and he gives him F, zero number marks or two marks. Then the matter went to the court. Then which one is true? And the court doesn't have any criteria to make any kind of a judgment. They don't have the glossary of Indian philosophical terminologies. So they used to make uh, some expert committees. I was also six, seven times I was a member of that committee. So which one is true? Now if the book comes out, Glossary of Indian Philosophy, then the court will refer to that book. That look, here is the book, and here is the definition of the concept, and to this extent you can make use of it. 
So it will come out very soon. So th there's the expert committee which the ministry has uh, constituted. So that also is some kind of a need to be done. And once it comes out, then again, it becomes a def you know, definitive situation. So freedom, uh, textbook writing is also a very important one. So how much to be incorporated and what is to be dropped completely. So we have to be vigilant at every level. So, so that you know, education becomes some kind of you know, hope for everybody. And let us hope for the better. NEP 2022 will be a kind of a new beginning, new hope for all of us. We are all teachers, colleagues, friends. So thank you very much you know, for uh, so much of attention. Thank you very much, Professor Keso, and all the dignitaries before us. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, being here, agreeing to uh, speak uh, in this workshop. Uh, keeping uh, time in mind, I will uh, uh, invite the next speaker, Professor Jayashree Mathur, who is an uh, eminent educationist. Uh, Professor Mathur has developed uh, many courses related to philosophy and education and has written extensively on the relationship of language and philosophy. Uh, Professor Mathur has a book on that. And then she has very interesting Ooh. work on the relation between Neoplatonic philosophy and Indian philosophy. She has been a fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. Uh, I request Professor Mathur to uh, kindly deliver a lecture, the presidential address. Thank you, ma'am. Um, actually, I was quite confused <laughs> why I was asked by Professor Kumar to come here because um, all my life I have pleaded with the philosophy department to start a course in philosophy of education and been turned down because uh, I remember Professor, um, <laughs> she was my teacher also, I have studied here in the, in, your, in the philosophy department, but I remember Professor Margaret Chatterjee looking down her nose and saying, what is philosophy of education? What do you mean by it? And so I, I'm thankful that you have, uh, and I really, really appreciate. Do you have a paper? Yes. Philosophy of yes. Education. Oh, very good. So somewhere something stuck. In huh? JNU, In JNU you have. Yeah. So, yeah. But th this I'm talking of the. I've retired now for ten years, and this must be much before that. This must be in the 80s or 90s that I was running around trying to find some space for philosophy of education. And therefore, what you have done today is really commendable, that uh, we are talking of uh, uh, curriculum and uh, pedagogy, and uh, I'm not so sure that it's such a great idea to talk of quality assurance, because assurance and even quality is more of a market kind of a term. But then let's face it, we are, um, education has become a handmaiden to the market. And it's uh, um, not surprising that higher education is following, is following. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, liberal education will have any meaning or even has any meaning now. And I'm, I'll be very happy if philosophy survives this uh, market. Um, I can see the effort and also I can see in the in write-up which you sent me that uh, teachers are concerned about how and how this discipline will survive, how, uh, how to create the interest of a, a student uh, and how to retain it in, in, in something which uh, does not sell in the job market. So um, accolades to all of you teachers who are, who are sticking in staying on in this discipline and keeping it alive and accolades to philosophy departments who are also doing that. Now, the Professor Singh uh, 
uh, talked about um, concepts, philosophy. He talked, of course, of philosophy and concepts, and then critical thinking. And I was thinking that, you know, his uh, presentation could form a framework for developing uh, syllabi in, uh, philo in philosophy. Uh, and I, I was wondering um, how the syllabi which have been created uh, have been created. Of course, the, um, my understanding of philosophy, the little there is, is lost somewhere in education, or, but the, that idea of uh, uh, philosophy as wisdom, somehow, uh, even though Professor Kumar said, now it's come to <laughs> wisdom, of wisdom of love rather than love of wisdom. But somehow the expectation, I'm sure all of you have faced it, from anybody who's associated with philosophy is that, um, so what do you think? You are a philosopher, right? So that expectation of wisdom is still there. Though what we are handling just now is the study of philosophy. And the, the study of philosophy is um, <laughs> different, I think, from what is expected of the philosopher. And the, 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 I think that uh, we really need to bring uh, to focus that why this discipline uh, was, was kept as a university discipline or, uh, and how it has survived and what, what is the expectation from it as the sciences and the social sciences serve uh, various uh, purposes, what is the expectation from philosophy? And uh, I think that the expectation from uh, philosophy uh, is that um, is that it should as as uh, as Professor Singh said, of course, that it should help in developing critical thinking and what have you. But also, uh, it, it is expected that we'll be able to give a sort of a world perspective to the, to the so that you're, you're stepping out of your narrower domains and coming into a wider space. Of, and that, uh, uh, by studying it, you would form some sort of perspective which will cross uh, geographical and political boundaries. Which, as I'm quite convinced that um, ideas, uh, uh, concepts, uh, uh, don't respect these boundaries. Even though we may claim that some ideas are Indian, I often wonder what is meant by Indian? What is Indian philosophy? That it was written here? That it was born here? Uh, who, who, is an, who is Indian? <laughs> and uh, should we really be confining this great discipline and this, uh, uh, this, this whole uh, quest of man to, to know quest of man to reach somewhere, to quest of man to uh, know himself, herself, himself. Uh, should we confine it to uh, Indian or Western or uh, what have you? And in any case, what does Western mean? What does West mean? And where does East end and where does West begin? So uh, when we, when we make these categories and we, um, we draw sort of boundaries, I feel that at some point we are doing a disservice also to the uh, 
uh, to the philosophical, to, because I think uh, all said and done, of course, uh, what philosophers have written and what they have thought through the ages is priceless, and that, and we we do need to read and study and uh, think further on it. That goes without question, but. Uh, what is fundamental is really the questions the philosopher asks. That, and that is why I think that um, uh, philosophy came to be known as the mother discipline. Because now, uh, through the ages, the offspring have sort of fallen out of this very generous womb of the mother. Uh, first physics, then the other sciences, then the social sciences, then there's in, like psychology and others. In, in my memory, the, the department of psychology of Delhi University was part of the philosophy department. It was only, it's only because of the um, aspiration of uh, psychology to become a social science, because science is more prestigious, that uh, it uh, began to take shape as, a, of course, it had taken shape as a discipline, but separated itself from philosophy. The point being that the that philosophy uh, does remain. I mean, why and why did, why it's so? Because the fundamental questions of any discipline are philosophical in nature. And therefore, and that is undeniable. The, the, when it comes to this uh, thing of evolving curricula, we understand curricula, it's from the word curricula, curriculum, the course that you run to achieve a goal, right? That's what a curriculum is. And when we talk of curricula, we have already confined ourselves to a goal. Or you can say we have given ourselves a direction. We have defined the goal. I mean, there are ways of looking at it. But uh, a curriculum uh, is then necessarily something which uh, certainly helps you, but it, it is also something which uh, can contains a particular discipline into, uh, into its boundaries so that uh, biology gets encased in, in, in this much, in uh, these boundaries, and chemistry gets encased in these boundaries. They are all knowledge systems. But then, they, and then, uh, then we go looking for um, interdisciplinary. So first we create these disciplines and we believe, we've begun to believe that this is knowledge, that uh, that, it, that which is encased in these various um, categories is knowledge. And you and I know that categories are man-made and uh, they, are, they are made for us to understand uh, things things better, and who knows better than you all that uh, the say the categories of Western so called Western philosophy uh, may be totally unsuitable to study Indian philosophy to study Hindu thought. The, that uh, there may not be, as Professor Singh pointed out, that there are there are may not be the kind of polarities which exist in Western thought, in Indian thought. There may not be this kind of a very rigid differentiation between uh, a, a metaphysique and an epistemology. There may not be. That, therefore, there may not have risen this need of the, in the journey of philosophy to um, Western philosophy to drop metaphysics totally out, eliminate metaphysics from its system, or uh, to create the kind of, a, a, I call it a desert of Quinean 
<laughs> dimensions where uh, philosophy almost got gets lost. So uh, when we create these uh, curricula, when we create disciplines, what we are doing to the knowledge is that we are uh, fragmenting it and then we make attempts to bridge it together with interdisciplinarity, etc. That this, the second thing I want to say is that uh, the, this whole thing of, somebody mentioned, you said that human resource, I think it's, you made a very good point because uh, how do you reduce a human to an economic resource? We used to have a ministry of education but it became Ministry of Human Resource Development. So, so now the resource has to be, uh, human resource has to be developed. Nobody is talking of character building, man making, which have they become totally irrelevant? Are we, uh, do we not need, uh, human beings who, who, are, who are good human beings. I mean, here I'm bringing in the ethical. Uh, how, how, do we, uh, how do we educate for that kind of a potential human being to be developed? Uh, the, now the whole thing is to uh, educate um, into a particular discipline. So, and that begins right in school now, with uh, in the in class ten, twelve, wherever it is that you go, you do what is called streaming, and then uh, you choose at that time. I remember, I'm, I I uh, must have been what thirty plus when I was streamed into science because I made the mistake of achieving high grades in class eight. So that is another thing. Achievement uh, and performance have become, are, are the measure of, uh, of, of your uh, ability in, in, uh, in anything. In no, not in anything, in knowledge acquisition and delivery. Some, we were talking of delivery. What does all this mean? What does it mean that uh, you, you are preparing a human being or you are educating a human being or are you schooling the human being? Uh, never mind human being even. Even human is not important. You are... Uh, you are uh, uh, schooling the individual into a particular um, knowledge system so that she can be uh, become a good resource to be uh, to be fed into uh, that factory um, so so we are talking now in terms of um, inputs and outputs so here is the input at, at age six into class one. And there's the outpunk, output, the finished product at the other end, which can be used into the market. I mean, this whole vocabulary of the NEP, I'm, I'm sure it is, there are things to admire in the policy. But the whole vocabulary is the vocabulary of the market. And uh, it, it really pains me that um, it, it does not talk uh, at all of what I, I feel is human. But uh, the, the uh, I mean, there, there is, a, you cannot contest the broad objectives of the NEP, you are talking of the, Talking of student-centric approach, I mean, this is the dream of every pedagogue. Uh, all our lives we have pleaded for, 
what somebody said, some kind of a uh, training or initiation into methods of teaching or into pedagogy for the university teachers also, for uh, teachers per se, the, the teacher as a pedagogue, uh, the university professor is, uh, knows everything. And the, if, if, you, if, you, if we look at the classroom, it's it, uh, with the podium for the lecturer or the uh, teacher and the seat, uh, seats for the uh, learners, okay, right? And you seat the learner one behind the other and they all face the podium, which means that the teacher knows, the professor knows, and then, and, and she is, she's telling you what she knows. You do not know, Professor Kumar said, that uh, we, we, we treat them as tabula rasa, that we assume that you do not know, and that we know. And the, also, there is no concept of learning from the peer, because the peer is sitting behind you. So there is no communication even in the structures of, uh, of a classroom. Or, to my mind, if we have to think, even start thinking of pedagogy, we have to think of these structures. We have to think of uh, what we can, uh, how we can help each other to learn, how as um, peers we help each other to learn. And the, uh, how, the other thing somebody else said, I was, I'm very happy with what I've been hearing all morning, that the teacher should design her own course. They're doing it in JNU. You hire a teacher, he said, and then she designs the course, which she, now you and I have not designed the syllabi which we are teaching. We are distant from it. It is not our perception of what philosophy should be taught. It is definitely a, a representative body which has done it. I'm not questioning that. But it is not the individual teacher, but the expectation from the, is from the individual teacher to deliver. I, I've been hearing these words to deliver, to engage the student, to keep her interest alive. How many students sit in your class? At least 40? Average teachers here? All of you? About 40? And uh, the expectation is that we as a jadu so that you can hold their attention. In the sense that how, uh, how, is, how is the teacher expected to become this excellent pedagogue with innovative ideas without any training? <laughs> without any training, without any thought being given to the three components here. The subject matter, the teacher, and the learner. I mean, uh, is, is the subject matter um, anywhere near the experience? You've been talking of the experience of the learner? No, the, at least teachers of history uh, get students who have studied history at school. <coughs> Do we get? students who study philosophy at school. And long ago, I, I worked with Professor Ansari, and we drew out that CBSC uh, syllabus. It was instituted. The schools took no interest in it. And uh, finally, about two schools were left in which philosophy was still taught. But the, uh, the uh, some st UP. 
यस सो लॉजिक यू नो सम कोई विफ तो आए फलसफे की वो तो इट्स इट्स अ न्यू डिसिप्लिन टू विच अंडर ग्रेजुएट टीचर्स अच्छा अरे वाह तो ये दिस होल थिंग विच एन ई पी के जो ब्रॉड ऑब्जेक्टिव हैं जिसमें स्टूडेंट सेंट्रिक तो बहुत अच्छा है लेकिन स्टूडेंट के का जो का जो एक्सपीरियंस है वो आपने कैसे गेज किया यू हैव मेड कोर्स फॉर all students that this was always my argument against the national curriculum framework also that you assume that uh, every student can understand or uh, the, the moment you dole it out she will absorb and that she she will uh, um, understand these uh, whatever the concepts or it's good to have faith in their abilities their reason their um, willingness but are we really looking at what will motivate a student to learn we are talking of student centrism but do we really look at why will a student want to study philosophy why also what what is her idea of philosophy when she joins the course does she have any is it some esoteric idealistic idea or is it some uh, unknown terrain which she is entering i often wonder what un in the masters programs yeah i am talking of the undergrad because the undergraduate has not encountered uh, abstra abstraction in school in fact even the school does not even expose you to reading to reading anything other than the textbook so you know when when uh, when when you am i overstepping the time when we are when you enter the university what do you come for do you come for certification or do you come for learning and then and uh, uh, then after that when we talk of quality quality assurance who whose quality and have we talk, have we thought about this whole uh, dynamics of equality and quality have we uh, given thought to when we say education for all i'm not saying that it's a wrong idea or equal educational opportunity for all or um, then are we sacrificing excellence are or uh, uh, or um are we creating uh, also creating space for excellence also maybe through research as you all have been saying maybe through other uh, structures also but as far as can it be equal can it ever be equal is if
quality assured when we uh, then uh, addressed it through the committee, the Yashpal committee addressed the whole problem and re redressed it also. But that has to be done in the universities too because it's all very well to say ye bhi padhana chahiye, wo bhi padhana chahiye. Lekin how much can a student absorb one of the units in one of the semesters tucked in a corner says Descartes to Kant. Are bhai, are you serious? Another unit says Shat Darshan. Are how am I going to do it as a pedagogue? If I am really to, uh, I'm, if I am really teaching the person and not teaching philosophy, we have to differentiate between these two. Teaching a subject is one thing, but teaching the learner is quite another. When you are teaching the learner, and if the NEP says that it is uh, student-centric, then you have to be aware of what the learner is capable of. Aapke reading list dekhi hai mene, for one semester, about a, more than 100 pages, school mein usne bichare ne kabhi reading kari nahi. So, <laughs> how, I mean, what I'm saying, these are realities we'll have, we'll have to address. Master's level. Annual Thana. Semester, Bilkul. 
semester the no no don't be sorry it's i'm glad to get feedback but the semester is a very uh, oppressive structure especially for uh, uh, a subject like philosophy because time to lagta hai na absorb karne mein to by meri to yahi guzarish hai ki think about these things and address them when you teach that's thank you that's i think i should stop now <laughs> yeah okay okay so uh, thank you professor mathur uh, we are going to break for tea for 10 minutes so please be back here after 10 minutes and then we will have professor babu's lecture so after that we will have lunch after professor babu's lecture so uh, we just break for tea for 10 minutes I would like to sit here with Professor Singh. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I see. <laughs> check 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 yeah our students yes so we do not have any program we have mc pg ah wo to padhe so as i said to what happens
just wondering whether which mic is working. <laughs> You can also use it. Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I request everyone to be seated, please. No, please. Stand. I'll stand. Oh, no, that's okay. He can uh, speak here. That will be fine. Huh. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Suresh Babu. He is a professor at the Zakir Hussain Center for Educational Studies, JNU. He is a member of the Global Social Studies Center, University of Cologne, Germany. Uh, he has a, a book titled Critical Pedagogy and the uh, uh, Cultures of Learning in India, so which will be, I think, uh, published by Rutledge. So uh, I uh, request him to uh, deliver a talk on, I think, critical pedagogical practices. Thank you, sir. So very, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm really thankful to Professor Keshav uh, inviting me to share some some of my thoughts, which I recently, no, began to develop as an interest in my research area. Although I trained as a student of sociology, I was fascinated to look at sociology of knowledge. So somehow I ended up in a, in a center which discusses do research, teach students on what is education all about. <coughs> so recently I began to think of uh, something related not only sociologically but also educationally. And I thought uh, these two area, uh, perhaps two disciplines, uh, somewhere merge together. There is an overlapping concern between the sociology as a discipline and education as a discipline. So, to my mind, mm, other than philosophy, there is a take on sociologists also to look at how uh, we see the world as a society. At the end of the day, it also matters for the humans, right? So also, all the questions we discuss, everything in relation to the society. In relation to society and underline the fact that this is in relation to society always. So that relativism itself is a very problematic, I know, in, in the domain of philosophy, in sociology also. Any concept to be understood has to be in terms of in relation to how we see ourselves in the world. Therefore, I think sociology is also making sense of what is education all about. Probably I'll, my, my, my mind is also somehow related to what is social in the field of education. So I begin with some of the questions to look around how I share with you when Professor Keshav told me that Suresh if you could share some of the thoughts on critical pedagogy. I began to make a statement that how much criticality there in this very idea or the concept of criticality, right? 
how much criticality is there in the very concept of the criticism or critique right i was surveying yesterday to just to look at how many times nep used this word critical 44 times just spread it 44 times it is it is repeated the same concept critical and spread down in the complete text you see you can just do, well, anyway it is available now uh, earlier times it was not available to the public now i think it is available to all of us you can just uh, search a keyword you'll come to know that how many times this word repeatedly used in the text across the spectrum it's very interesting right i think seven or eight times it was all used professor singh also said critical thinking to my mind seven times it has appeared here and there i was also may i was also trying to make sense as a as a common <laughs> as a common sensical textbook to understand what is this this concept is defined in the nep text it's given to the public to discuss this matter because four years back i remember in my center itself we discussed the draft the draft runs to 467 page and the later on the final draft came up in the form of around 67 68 pages right it reduced to 67 pages and what made them to edit it and make it a small capsule group in a in a form even also we don't know what exactly this is all about so when you search about these concepts in the text itself to my mind nothing criticality in the text that actually drops the category critical therefore what we teach in the classroom also for critical pedagogy we talk of how much we know the textbook also the text also doesn't the nep also doesn't carry to define what professor singh said as a student of uh, as a teacher probably every teacher begins to define what is this category right what is that category what does it make sense to is it related to where it is placed this is also a matter of concern right therefore i would take something say from a critical theoretical framework from the frankfurt school itself because frankfurt school is the school which began to discuss this category critical as a critical itself <laughs> and the later on they themselves realized the fact that nothing is there in critical theory also right martha nozam later on wrote how much criticality is there in critical theories <laughs> right that's the point that's the point i think we need to be discussing very seriously because normative becomes critical and critical becomes normative right normative becomes a critical and a critical becomes a normative as a result we are unable to understand what is normative what is criticality therefore i will give some kind of a, this my maybe i am very provocative no i am not going to define any categories i have more provoke to look at how these concepts are played around in the policy making in the classroom discourses even in the textbook also in a everyday discourse also look at the media media uses always the critical 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 right we don't know what is that criticality all about right that's why i thought maybe important to us as a teachers when we engage with the classroom how classroom can be critical <laughs> right so i'll take it two three points the category is very broadened it is quite fascinating also we need to start reading because last five years i've been reading this text to make something out of it to write on what is critical i thought i will be doing something like a uh, culture of learning <laughs> right i came to the conclusion that critical learning is critical learning or critical pedagogy is a culture of learning that is not for the teacher and not for the student but also for the teacher i thought i would be addressing most of the concern to the teachers not to the students because a good teacher has to be a good student right uh, i would ask you to just to go back to your school days right just to go back to the school days and just to remember the memories of your school times right something not uh, rational 
but emotionally we all are attached to someone called a teacher right there is no reason but there is emotion <laughs> right and we if i ask any teacher here in philosophy may not be philosophy inviting you rather the teacher invites you to the world of philosophy i am invited to the sociology not because of the sociology it is because my teacher who teaches the basic of what is sociology right i think my mind teacher matters right but madam also said it is not a philosophy how philosophy is taught in the classroom right to to i, I begin to say that the teacher somehow in the nep in the even the curricula also reduced to the level of the instrument right to the level of the instrument what he abrama say we are cogs in the machines we were asked to teach this is what pedagogy this has to be curriculum so on so forth as a result where is my space as a teacher where is my freedom where is my sense of belonging as a teacher my sense of belonging as a teacher is also a matter of concern my place right my place in the classroom is a is a sense of belonging every teacher got a sense of belonging unless you feel that your your sense of belonging i don't think i can take a class so to begin with i think the normative conditions we have to create that is quite quite important in our times it can be in in terms of technical terms i will style it to technical terms is that during corona right and we all began to discuss about online learning and then i was looking at the data 31% of the school to 31% of the schools in india do not have access to electricity right and close to 82% of the school in the himalayan region i work on ladakh and their himalayan region of india 80 or close to 82% of schools do not have electricity across india we have around 31% in himalayan region 81% of the schools do not have electricity facility and we talk of online right and then we ask our the children to stay back at school at home right i think hardly 20% of the household hardly 20% of the household have more than two rooms in their houses right right yeah that means 80% of the 80 close to 80% of the household do not have a more than one room in india what is the normative condition look at the school and the family what are the environment we have created for this as far as the education is concerned it's a huge landscape right where we succeeded where do you take our entire educational system we talk about access to look at the data i still think that the empiricism matters why these empirical details will disturb us right not you always rational empiricism matters you need always it's not for a policy purpose when i introduce a fact in the classroom it hits the mind of the child because of the fact that i introduce a fact as it is I, I because i sit with my colleague who does something quantitative analysis in my in my center right very sophisticated statistical method he used the point is that what is the point to the problem facts brings to the problem right and now every fact is now you know fabricated right we live in the post truth world and how we introduce the child as a truth the fact and the truth right every truth is manufactured how you introduce the fact right census report should have been come right 10 should have come without the facts how are you going to ready how are you how are you i am really worried about economics how do you write a paper how a student of a researcher write a paper without referring to in relation what i said in relation to the facts the government of india produce how do you write 
So there are distorted fact. We lost the legitimacy of all the institutions. So the normative conditions which Habermas is talking about is completely, no, I, I don't know whether it is there or not. Right? It's not merely a question of access. It is a question of how we created the conditions for this the huge landscape which is highly diverse, plural, so on and so forth. Right? Therefore, I would I would argue that this normative conditions it is also somehow subverted, subverted. Right? This is also important in the classroom. Classroom is also eco ecology. I work on ecological system. This classroom is a ecology. And we have to create it. Right? The sociologists would say that this is a kind of a cosmo of a society. It represents society. Every student is unique in the classroom, right? You don't need to run to get the data to say, know that how many diversity exists. My own classroom here itself, we are diverse. How many languages we speak? Our appearances are different. Skin color is different, right? The way you perceive the world is different. When you express yourself, di different. Diversity is here itself. You don't need to run after to conceive some sometimes. Therefore, the ecosystems, we also should be familiar, I don't know, familiar, sensibilities. This also somehow in the classrooms, when we interact with the students or the teachers, that ecosystem, I don't know whether it exists or not, we are sensible enough or not, because of many other circumstances, because the, the issue is, the teacher is asked to always evaluate the student, right? It becomes an ideological, that's why. The second one, to my mind, is the, 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 the empirical, the world of empiricism. Because when, when we introduce something into the classroom as a subject matter, Emile Durkheim says that the rules of sociological method, right? There is a method. So it's not a problem. Durkheim says that when we introduce any problem in the classroom, the method and the problem, you bring both of them closer to, right? Bring the problem very close to the method. I don't know whether you call it epistemological questions or not, but in the classroom, the business of the teacher to introduce the problem and to make sense of the problem by bringing certain methodological questions, right? Otherwise, teacher, I, I think it will be very difficult to convey what is the problem. We, we deploy concepts in the class to begin with. And then also I introduce the problem. When I say students not understanding, I say the poverty is an example to understand this issue, inequality, so on and so forth. Right? So bringing problem close to the methodology is a real business of the teacher. It is not merely a problem. Right? It is epistemology, I think, not only philosophers. Every teacher in the classroom encounter the problem as well as the methodology. How I connect, how I relate these problems. The real struggle and the battle and the battlefield is in the classroom. Therefore, every teacher is a philosopher. Every teacher is a philosopher. Right? I don't think philosopher remains outside in the textbook, no. A teacher is a philosopher. Connecting the minds, right? Everything for the usefulness of the mind, anthropologists would say. What we are doing outside in the world, right, the external world, is for the usefulness of the mind. Therefore, that the world of empiricism, we should not be always, you know, uh, nowadays we don't want to think that empiricism doesn't hold any value today, right? But when it comes to the classroom, perhaps you have to produce something factual, correct, right? Otherwise, it doesn't hit on the mind of the child. Right? Something objectively, uh, Durkheim says, objectively factual. When you introduce any problem, that has to be objectively factual. And otherwise, stu that student would ask you, sir, is it empirically, uh, is it factually correct? Sometimes students ask, right? But teacher says that, no, don't ask these questions. Right. 
because madam also said this the pedagogue's question the quest for knowledge begins with asking fundamental questions not from the mouth of the teacher but from the mouth of the student perhaps that is the beginning of the critical pedagogy we began to listen to the students there and their voices right so here the problem is not merely empiricism but also we are dealing with the humans and their mind okay i would extend further the moment we introduce fact in the classroom we are also dealing with the, not the method we are not dealing with the problem but also we are dealing with the student i keep on searching anybody define who is a student <laughs> exactly <laughs> right any theories which you define who is a student <laughs> yes sir good yeah example uh, student <laughs> I, I, yeah. so I, I, I was searching. I was searching. I was searching any any study in India, which actually discusses gives a conceptual clarity on who is a student. Right? May there, professor? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the second. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. very good very good yeah so i i was searching some literature to understand this rudolf and rudolf also wrote a wonderful thesis on right they began with the students protest <laughs> instead of defining who is a student a student uh, their argument as a political philosophers they began to define students and their political activities right exactly so i was thinking that perhaps in indian context in the post colonial india a student is defined begins with the protesting <laughs> right so that's why in the classroom students will ask questions you know there's a puzzling there's a theoretical puzzle so therefore classroom is not from theory to the practice is very conventional I, I i beg to different right i beg to different it is not from theory to the practice <laughs> right why not the other way around so critical pedagogy bigs i think would give some signals to you know outside of the box of thinking right we all are confirmed to because the subject matter is there student has to succeed the exam so on so forth something has to be conveyed to the classroom as a result uh, we do not take into consideration to my mind classroom is theoretically oriented and we don't know much of theories also right we don't know much of theories what is the theory of classroom <laughs> right what is the theory of classroom a sociologist also would began to because he said they all the representation and the sub there to begin with the representation ends with the representation and the pedagogy always we teach in the classroom as a practice it's a conventional most comfortable theory so when you introduce pedagogy in the classroom it is quite pragmatic how efficiently we can deliver in the classroom okay convey to the student so pedagogy ends so that what is the value of pedagogy it is only pragmatic it's a functional utility is pedagogical is critical and then why we need a critical pedagogy the post factor right <laughs> critical and then the pedagogical so the, the dialectics to diacritic right the categories are not just uh, for the for the sake of categories played out here i think philosophers know they are very serious in this case right when you place a category 
the placement of the category is very critical. You can take it as a normative also. <laughs> and how a normative category becomes critical, to my mind, matters. And that has to be a pedagogical dialogue. Right? Therefore, I, to my mind, the empiricism with imagination. I would just to push the pedagogy further to understand critical pedagogy always talking about a hope. <laughs> right? Yeah. It is a hope. And it's also a liberating force. Both are political. <laughs> right? From sociology to the political, or a sociological theory to the political theory, is the amalgamation of educational theory to my mind. Right? The, yeah, the political and the political and the educational are the same. How much a political scientist understand the theory of education? And how education should understand the political theory of education is a problem. That's why we are narrowed down into the discipline. Right. Politics begins with the power and ends with the powerlessness. Education begins with the pedagogy, ends with the pedagogical. So there is no convergence. That's what the critical, critical theory is saying that. There is a convergence of ideas, convergence of the discipline. I don't know how much we understand interdisciplinarity. Talk about NEP talks about interdisciplinarity. Where is the convergence? I'm just hitting my mind on. I am trained in sociology. I'm unable to move out from my sociology. <laughs> Last 10 years, I'm in a different center. My colleagues are all different discipline, right? I'm just hitting on my mind. No, no, what I'm, I'm coming to. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah, I'm, I'm hitting. I'm hitting on. I'm hitting on. As a, as a teacher who taught, who trained in sociology, who taught, now teaching sociology, hits on the mind what is that interdisciplinarity. Right? So I would come to the last point. What I would say, John Dewey talks about interest. Without interest, there is no class. Right? Students' interests are there, teachers' interests are there. Unless we meet these two interests, there is no usefulness of classroom. Right? Interest talking about. I would also further say that there is a convergence of interest, not only between the teacher and the student, but also the disciplines. Right? We should have a strong dialogue, very detailed dialogue between the disciplines. It's good that you invited me at least to listen to all of them. Right? Really, I could. It's an, it's an ever-reaching experience for me and entire my life. I keep it this. Because first time I'm, I'm coming to a philosophy department to listening to my colleagues, right? So this is a rich experience for me to understand the world of bit what is philosophical, right? In a, in a way, there should be an interaction between the disciplines. We should be open to. I think that is the beginning of critical thinking, uh, critical pedagogy. So I would argue that students, defining students, is a very critical in the classroom. And the pedagogues are not merely in the conventional terms. We should listen to the students and look at the voices. Right? And then classroom can be a more poetic and reaching. That's it. I'll stop right now. Thank you. After that one, you can have lunch. Now, after which one? After the Iraq, she's uh, the, the Indian philosophy in the section. Is, she's there. Yeah. She's there. She's there. Huh? Oh, she, all right. She, she changed the session of this one. Each of us, Saroj, Sujata. Sujata went for oh, class. I know, huh? I know. That so one. we will have that session now. Uh, now it's selfish. Then, we will then have you lunch. tell them, we are not having special day. We are fine with it. It's only initiating the discussion. Yeah, they are okay, all like, like that to be informed. Yeah, Otherwise, that they are not. OK. Uh, Thank you. That was indeed a very interesting talk because I also believe that empirical uh, approaches are very, very important. We need to know our facts very well. Uh, so uh, I think we have time enough uh, before lunch to have one of the technical sessions on uh, Indian philosophy. So uh, I think Professor Inakshia will invite to uh, chair that session. We have three speakers for this. So we have uh, Professor Sujata Raju and Professor Jayanti Sahu and also Professor uh, Bhanu Sharma. But first Sujata Raju and uh, 
uh, Jayanti Sahu will go ahead with Indian philosophy and then uh, we will have Bhanu Sharma's presentation. So I request Professor Inakshi to please uh, uh, come here. with Indian philosophy and we see with the philosophy syllabi all around that it is you know very important to start with Indian philosophy from the very first semester. So we have uh, three speakers, uh, Dr. Sujata Raju, Dr. Jayanti Sahu and Dr. Bhanu Sharma. So uh, first I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Sujata Raju, oh Dr. Jayanti. Uh, to speak on Indian philosophy and her talk will be specially titled as Problems in Indian Philosophy. Is that so? Yes, uh, Problems in Indian Philosophy Syllabus. Problems no, no, in it's uh, uh, another yes. is no, no, it is uh, uh, open ended. It is uh, no, a teaching philosophy, Indian philosophy, and also issues with, uh, related to the pedagogy yeah, yeah. and any other aspects of it. They will initiate the debate after that. You with all the, the three, I just wanted to know, will these three talks be titled differently? Yeah. Yes, yes that the, actually nothing has given to, we have uh, said, uh, focused on the basically the pedagogy and the curriculum aspects and uh, the issues. Concerned. Okay, so that okay. will be the so common uh, theme yes, of yes, thought. Exactly. So, yeah, uh, I invite Dr. Sahu. Yes, 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 I just will bring something. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, respected uh, Professor Singh, he is my teacher and mentor, and Professor Kesap, and respected uh, Professor Inachi, and my dear friends. Uh, it is, uh, I'm sharing some of my uh, ideas with you about Indian philosophy. I'll also say that uh, one thing I, I'll put before you 
uh, when I do philosophy, whether I'm doing Indian philosophy or uh, Western philosophy, the first thing comes to my mind, what we are doing? I just put uh, the questions, uh, what, what we are doing, why we are doing, how we are doing, and for whom we are doing. So this, uh, these are the basic questions arise. And uh, when we talk about, and all these answers to all these questions are very much there in Darsanic tradition. And I am here to defend my tradition. I, I find when we talk about a, uh, uh, any kind of model, whether it is historical method, a pedagogy, historical method or uh, textual analysis, comparative analysis and critical en engagement and reflection. And that in fact started with Vedas and the Upanishad. We have a very, uh, I'll say it is a Shastra par Parampara. When we talk about the Indian knowledge system and its uses, one thing that comes to my mind, its richness and eternality. Somehow we are not uh, like, uh, if you go through the systems, and the systems are developed in such a beautiful manner that they themselves teach you the pedagogy. That if you uh, try to establish Charvak that as a system, materialistic system, by criticizing and uh, accepting some of the element and rejecting the, some of the element, then they establish their philosophy. And the same with the Buddhism, you find a proper methodology to go through that, whether it is a kind of uh, uh, comparative one, uh, the, uh, establishing their theory of perception, they also do a comparative analysis with the other system and establish their theories. And we have a, uh, if we take the Indian philosophical traditions, you, you find that there is a parampara, then uh, that uh, parampara is established through, as I said, that there was a argument, uh, th there was a thesis and the counter thesis, then there is a synthesis, dialectical method, jisko dwandav bola jata hai. It is Purva Paksh and Uttar Paksh is always there. So you find that uh, it is uh, predominantly find in the Nyabasisic system, uh, logic and epistemology, where they have given you the 16 epistemological categories which is very difficult to think about that mind, that how is the tradition allows you to speak and autonomy, the debate and discussion and dialogue. Through that, you can come to the conclusion whether you agree with me or disagree with me. So that the point of agreement and disagreement is established through the dialogue, debate, and the discussion. And that was very much part of their, within the 108 Upanishad, when they talk about that the tradition begin with a kind of sutra parampara. The parampara is that it's not very dogmatic. It allows others to speak about their text. So the textual parampara, jo sastra parampara suru hua, usme teen cheez tha, ek sutra parampara, ek bhasya parampara, then you have a tika parampara. So sutra talks about the original text, whether it is Vedan sutra, Nyaya sutra, Sankhya sutra, then there are commentaries, thousands of commentaries and critical reflection goes into that and making them to reach out to the public. So Darsanic Parampara is always being rejected and neglected by the people saying that nothing is there, predominant is spiritualism. Spiritualism is one of the aspects of Indian philosophical tradition. There is logic, there is metaphysics, there is ethics, there is epistemology, strong epistemology, and apart from that, there are two dominant approaches based on Indian philosophical tradition. One is faith-based learning, and one is the experiential model of learning. What I say, I practice, I tell my students to practice. Okay, so if you have a interest, the first thing is that, what is, why, what is the problem? Why do we talk about the NEP and the problems within the NEP? The contemporary, contemporary world, especially higher education, to my mind, you do not agree with me, that's disinterestedness among the teacher and the students. 
So first thing to learn is that you have to respect the tradition, whichever tradition it is philosophical tradition, whether it is continental, whether it is Western philosophy or Indian philosophy. Philosophy is same everywhere. Only thing is that uh, I differentiate this way, Darsanic Parampara is purely ex experiential, everything is practice, whether you agree or dis disagree. Quality of education is not a major concern. As I'm happy that Professor Kesav has brought out, the quality assurance, and who will define that? The teacher will define. When we enter inside the class, we should know that the proper training, uh, as already Professor Singh has highlighted many things, so I do not want to, he has given a very detailed description about Indian tradition and the methodology, doubt, concept of doubt, concept of error, and so many things he has discussed. So what is that quality of education we are talking about? But who will decide quality for us? Nobody is giving, uh, nobody outside will decide. We have to decide that what we can do best for teaching, whether it is logic or Indian philosophy. So we have to create that atmosphere. We have to learn the text. We have to reach out to the public. The philosophy, the problem is that we, we are giving a, only the classroom teaching, which makes the things abstract. That social engagement and communitarian feeling that is most important, critical reflection. That whether, why do you disagree with me? You say the same thing which I said. So when we come to the uh, platform of education, we should not have ideological differences. Differences is there. But we have to work together so that we can bring something. That's why faith, honesty, and integrity are no more there. Sincerity, hard work, mutual understanding, and respect are not in practice. Compassion and gratitude are no longer practiced inside the institute. The curriculum doesn't provide enough space for practical learning and critical thinking. The curriculum we have designed, but how to work out whether that Charvak philosophy or Buddhist theory of dependent origination, how it is helpful in the contemporary world, or Vedanta, theory of the self model, the theory of perception, which they have given, how, how uh, interesting is in comparison to Nyayavasasik, Buddhism, Charbak, and there is a comparative analysis. When Sankaracharya established the theory of uh, Advaita Vedanta, he criticized all the systems. Compare, that and yes. And then when uh, Nyaya theory of perception, historical method is important. Because when Nyay came, already Buddhism was there. And to criticize Buddhist theory of perception, Nyay developed another theory of perce perception. So you have to see how the system, they have grow, continuity, and their change. And the continuity and change was never a kind of form of uh, violence or a kind of uh, rejecting others. But for a social development, for the dialectic, so that is what they are uh, doing. Uh, still, I have five one, minutes. One minute. One minute. One. Okay. So <laughs> that's see what uh, what my point of submission is that saying that in India, and if you don't know Indian philosophy, and if you don't have the interest, and that uh, that we are not teachers. Okay. So my point is that I always believe read something, then criticize, then say that this is not acceptable. But without learning the text, we all are learners. And uh, if you just say that, no, no, darshan is nothing, so I'm uh, not going to accept. I have a Bharatiya darshan. It's a Shastra Parampara. Nobody can challenge it. I'm telling you, nobody can challenge it. That's, uh, so I conclude with the Sopener's statement. Uh, it's the solace of my, uh, solace of my life and solace of my death. So the experiential learning finally is going to establish the logic of it, logic and rationality of their systems. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jayanti. We will take the questions all together. First, let us have the three talks. Uh, Dr. Sujata. A very good afternoon to all of you. Professor Singh, Professor Keshav, Professor Inaksi, and all my colleagues, friends, juniors. Very good afternoon to all of you. And Janti has mentioned so many things, 
okay and uh, we all are teaching undergraduate students okay and there are so many varieties of papers in indian philosophy and see the titles fundamentals of indian philosophy okay and then um, introduction to indian philosophy names are different one student of mine asked me ma'am what is fundamentals of indian philosophy what is the textual study of indian philosophy so many things are there and i say it's okay whatever may be the pedagogy they may be historical they may be geographical they may be schools background sutras background many things are there but one thing we all teachers at least for undergraduate students they have never studied philosophy in schools first they have to get acquainted with the words and generally we try if you are teaching nay system you are teaching charvaka system you are teaching any systems of indian philosophy at least you start with the shramanic and brahmanic traditions it's all right but thing is if a student at least he is very he or she is very clear about one school his life is liberated one school we should not say nyaya doesn't talk about the self nyaya says say, buddhism doesn't take about talk about the self nyaya says self is devoid of consciousness vedant say consciousness is the only reality but why it is and all the time we are talking about pedagogy pedagogy every school has a proper methodology how to go about it charvaka when you teach charvaka why charvaka admits only perception not inference it is a debate i think many texts have written on this charvaka sarvadarshan sangra starting from sarvadarshan sangra other texts have given why they have accepted only pramana and why they have rejected inference but in our classroom we just get two lectures just two lectures okay with the lots of difficulties we say perception these are the thing and why they reject inference just simply bring to the nay school and you say inference they have rejected only this much we can do but there are so much literature how they do not accept inference similarly with other schools also uh, what i mean to say basically if we teach undergraduate students whatever methods we use the main fundamental method is conceptual clarity why the school says like this why the founder sutra says this why the commentary gives very lucid way how how to understand the sutras okay and even if they are clear about any particular system of sarvadarshan sangraha i think that will lead to their entire life uh, with this submission i want to end this and i'm just transferring it to banu गड़बड़ हो जाती है फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट मी बिगिन विद द थैंक्स टू द डिपार्टमेंट फॉर गिविंग मी दिस and there is no dichotomy why we are dividing indian says no we will hold our to our indian philosophy westerner says we can come in seep in let's gel together okay fine no issues about that but no let me let me please uh but one thing is there and that is what she said i was coming to that only indians uh, philosophy or bharatiya i would call it bharatiya darshan rather than indian philosophy bharatiya darshan gels the materialistic aspect along with the biological aspect along with the spiritual aspect along with the psychological aspect. everything is clubbed together gel together as a totality it is giving you it's like a bouquet it's not only one flower or one color is the whole thing and uh, the basic point which all the schools of indian philosophy or bharatiya darshan or archintan भारतीय चिंतन भारतीय परंपरा 
says is that this life is like a journey, jeevan yatra hai. Aur yatra hai to we must have a destination. Jaysay hum yaha pe aaye hai, koi kaise aaya hai, we know ke isne time tak aana hai. Simply, similarly our life is again, Bharatiya Parampara Anusar, it has own channels. Be it ashram system, brahmacharya, grast, vanparas, sanyas, be it one, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra and be it the Purusharth, Dharma, Arth, Moksh, Kaam and Moksh. And now we want, you know, everybody is talking about hierarchy. I personally believe there is no hierarchy. Be it Varn Ashram, be it the Ashram system or be it the Purusharth, there is no hierarchy. And why is it not, uh, why I believe, what is the rational behind it, why I am saying it so? Because when the Purusut says, Brahman from the mouth, Kshatriyas from the uh, thighs, Vashas from the arms, and Shudra from the feet, it is not saying that head is superior to your feet. We cannot say my heart is superior to my liver or my kidney. Every, everything has its own function. So in order to have a holistic society, in order, in order to have a progressive society, in order to have a disciplined society, in order to have a, a full development in all forums, be it individualistic, be it the social, we have all these things together. And they are gelled together. Ashram system, Varn Ashram, and Purusharth, they all are gelled together. When we teach the uh, Purusharth in the class, you cannot just say, okay, the way talk about three varg, ar dharm kaam. Charva talks about kaam. Jainism talks about dharm and moksha. And, you know, Upanishad, they starts with ar dharm kaam and moksha. We cannot say that. Why we cannot say that? Because it is not a hierarchy. It is what is my goal. How I want to go. If I want to go to America, I cannot go in metro train. That is simple. If my destination is America, I want to go from here to America, how can I go in metro train? Metro nahi le jayegi. If my aim is liberation, I don't like that word though. Moksha or mukti. Then of course, mujhe kaam mein aur arth mein thoda apne aap ko restrain karna padega. Because they are not fulfilling my aim. एक जीवन की यात्रा है और जीवन यात्रा का एक भय है, गोल है, हमें वो गोल पकड़ना है और वो गोल कैसे बनाना है, वो मेरा पर्सनल गोल है, वो गोल मेरे को कोई चीज बताएगी नहीं, because my life is mine, my journey is mine, my life, the all the struggles are my own struggles, the agents own struggles, they can be guided by different different schools or different different philosophy unke apne darshan hai main charva ko agar leke chalu to charva kya keh raha hai kamo hi ekah parmo dharma hum kya padhte hain aur padhate hain kaam purushar kaam bas aur kuch nahi hai mar wo usko hi dharm maan rahe hain mind you kaam does not mean only accumulate wealth only accumulate all the goods every luxuries वो ठीक है दे एग्री आई एग्री व्हेन दे से कि भई घी पीना है उधार ले लो तो ले लो कोई बात नहीं व्हाई बिकॉज़ बॉडी इज इंपॉर्टेंट सीड फर्दर दैट इज ओके नो डाउट टू पुट इट यू कैन गो विद दैट गोल बट दैट बिकम्स योर धर्म कौटल्य क्या कह रहे हैं सुखस्य धर्म मूल सॉरी या सुखस्य मूलम धर्म धर्मस्य मूल अर्थ ये भी अर्थ पे आ रहे हैं अर्थस्य मूल राज राजस्य मूलम इंद्रिय जय इंद्रिय जय क्या वही काम कंट्रोल व्हाट वी पर्सनली और व्हाट वी जनरली टेल व्हेन द मोमेंट वी से काम एवरी बॉय एंड गर्ल यू नो दे हैव रेड चीक्स दे इक्वेटेड टू सेक्सुअल प्लेजर इस काम ओनली ए सेक्सुअल प्लेजर नो बिकॉज़ काम इज इम्पोर्टेंट काम के बिना कर्म नहीं होगा काम ना नहीं होगी तो कर्म नहीं कर पाओगे कोई भी कर्म नहीं कर पाओगे अच्छा भी नहीं बुरा भी नहीं काम ना होनी जरूरी है काम ना कैसी होनी चाहिए वो इम्पोर्टेंट है काम ना कैसी होनी चाहिए अगेन द डिफरेंट स्कूल्स विल ब्रिंग इन काम ना लोक संग्रह के लिए होनी चाहिए काम ना सोशल गुड के लिए होनी चाहिए 
कामना किसके लिए होनी चाहिए चारवाक फिलासफी ये नहीं कहती कि इसका व्यू लेकर मैं खा लूँ और इसका व्यू ले लूँ और दूसरे आए और मुझे मार के मेरी चीज़ खा जाए वो भी ये नहीं कहते क्योंकि वो काम को धर्म मान रहे हैं एंड धर्म इज इम्पॉर्टेंट आई कम लेटर टू दैट now we were we were talking about in the earlier session regarding the resource human resource aur maine aapse ashram system ki bhi baat kahi jo first hamara ashram hai that is brahmacharya to hum brahmacharya mein kya kar rahe hain we are doing we are learning the skills and what will that skill do jab hum gharast mein jayenge we will utilize that skill and who are we we are the part and parcel of the society and how will we help the society while becoming the resource for the society human resource ka matlab ye nahi hai the way i uh, matlab do its ka connotation that is up to us how we take it but human resources how am i helpful in the progress of the society that is something which is important here How will I help my society? Because लोक सग्रह और वासुदेव कुटुम्बकम की बात सब कर रहे हैं मर ये बनेगा कब So the moment as a ब्रह्मचारी I have learned, I acquired the skill, and now I go to घरस्थ And घरस्थ is when I am totally in connection with the society, direct connect. And that is a point where the काम takes over. And काम is what? काम इज नॉट ओनली द सेक्सुअल प्लेजर काम इज द चौसठ कलाएं द सिक्सटी फोर स्किल्स एस्थेटिक्स आपकी उसमें आती है म्यूजिक उसमें आता है डांस उसमें आता है आप यू थिंक ऑफ एनी थिंग एंड इट विल कम इन द गैमेट ऑफ काम यू वंस यू हैव दैट वाई डू वी से वी शुड लिसन टू म्यूजिक बिकॉज म्यूजिक इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू आर लाइफ वॉट विल म्यूजिक गिव मी If I am sad and listen to a happy music, hormonal changes होते हैं यही तो होता है कि हम खुश हो जाते हैं All of sudden, if I start listening to the uh, sad songs, क्या होगा अच्छा भला माहौल है आप बैठ जाओगे मर ही तो जाना है क्यों करें So music is important, but everything थिंग जब हम सब ले के चल रहे हैं घरस्थ में तो घरस्थ का क्या है Do not forget the three debts. तीन ऋण है जो पितृ ऋण देव ऋण ऋषि ऋण और वहां पे द होल आर लाइफ इज फॉर द सोशल वेलफेयर इज फॉर द सोसाइटी वेलफेयर बिकॉज अंटिल ऑन लेस सोसाइटी इज नॉट प्रोग्रेसिंग माय प्रोग्रेस इज ऑफ नथिंग ऑफ नो नो यूज वही बात है ना अपना आलिशान बंगला बना लें और चारों तरफ झुग्गी झोंपड़ी होगी तो आप रात को सो नहीं पाएंगे कि वो आके अटैक करके लूट के ना ले जाए कब अच्छा लगेगा जब चारों तरफ everybody is happy then only you can be happy otherwise you will be always be scared ke are ye na le jaye wo na le jaye maine uska loota hai wo mere se na loot le so it is important now we oh, okay it is important now i come to the dharma dharm is uh, usually hum jab dharm ki baat karte hain to dharm ki baat mein bahut se dev there are so many sutras dharma rakshati rakshat अहिंसो परमो धर्म धर्म हिंसा तथा अवचार धारण ध्यान बहुत चीज़ें हैं मगर धर्म क्या है जो दस लक्षण हैं धर्म के दैट इज ब्रह्मचर्य सत तप दान क्षमा संयम शौच अहिंसा शांति अस्ते अब यही धर्म जो है इट कैन नॉट बी ट्रांसलेटेड इनटू एनी एनी अदर टर्म बिकॉज नन नो अदर टर्म बी इट मॉरल ड्यूटी be it your moral obligation be it a religion will not have all these things into it so what exactly is dharm dharm is something which takes on everything which is the essence for example hamara dharm kya hai manav dharm manav dharm ke karan main manav banungi i am born as a human as a human does not make me human to manav dharm mere mein hai manavta mere mein hai tabhi main manav hu so this is important there and then i come to the term, that is the concept of moksha yeah i'm concluding and uh, why i'm saying moksha because moksha is basically uh, it was a major goal for jains and i personally feel that upanishad when they introduced moksha the concept of moksha which was not in the vedas it was there 
through the Jains, their influence and moksha came to into existence. Though we believe that Gita uh, is the part and parcel of the Upanishadic philosophy, but there is a basic difference between the Upanishad's goal and the Gita's goal. And let me tell you frankly, Nishkam Karm term does not come in Gita. Bhagavad Gita mein kahi a term nahi aati in Nishkam Karm. Vaha Anasakti Yoga aayega, Masthit Pragya aayega, vaha all terms aayengi. Nirankar Bhav aayega, magar Nishkam Karm nahi hai. But what exactly is the difference between the Upanishadic Moksha and the Bhagavad Gita's Moksha? Upanishads, when they talk about Moksha, they talk about the Nivritti Mark. And as we are well aware, that Nivritti Mark means that you get alienated from the society. Yeah, coming, just coming. You get alienated from the society. As a result, you go into inaction. Whereas the Bhagavad Gita is gelling both of them, Pravritti Mag and Nivritti Mag, the Vedas brings the Pravritti Mag, where you are, you are doing your actions for your a particular desire, and the Bhagavad Gita is bringing both of them, and the major goal of Bhagavad Gita is Loka Sangraha. That is how to retain society, how to retain an ethical society. Since... Uh, where we were having a talks, just two, three lines, just two, three lines. Jo mein karti hu apni class mein, hum concepts padhate hain, that is good. But if we are not able to relate those concepts to today's world, jo bachcha dekh raha hai, jo bachcha jaan raha hai, to we will not be, we will not be able to impart knowledge, what we are there for. For example, agar maine nishkam karm ke baare mein batana hai, to mein ye zaroor kehti hu ki chitra lekha movie dekho. Aapko pata chalega nishkam kya hota hai. How you do something for others, especially students are interested. Aisi baat nahi hai, but yes, initial classes mein hume thodi dikkat hoti hai because philosophy is not everybody's cup of tea. Har log dejected ho ke aate hain, kahi aur nahi mila, to philosophy le li. That is that is a fact which all of us are well aware of. Very few are there who take philosophy and they take with a one particular aim. Yeah, that is with UPSC. Thank you. Yes, please. Huh. Uh, as per my understanding, uh, I think we have got discussed the curricular pedagogy mm -hmm. uh, given the fact that we are and we will be teaching any 2020, 2022, I think, uh, and as the panelists and the esteemed uh, speakers have all highlighted, I think uh, the crux of the matter, as I understand, is that anything is not going anywhere. We are all got to deal with it. So my understanding is how best can we, uh, you know, in the philosophy department, given the kind of uh, challenges that most of us college teachers are facing in the colleges across, uh, you know, the discipline, where we are getting uh, the challenge that we are facing is that many of our students, a, the biggest challenge is the number of classes that have gotten reduced. And in that, to be able to focus on concepts and give a clarity to our students, to the fact that many of our students are not uh, wanting to opt for the discipline-specific electives. They would rather pursue a G because that's going to give them a minor degree. I think what we all should be working towards is how best can we, whosoever is teaching the paper, form groups and have a pattern of, you know, addressing the teaching pedagogical method so that when you know the kind of challenges that we write as soon as an examination paper is set and there are, there's a bombardment of questions on the philosophy fraternity group because the same pattern has not been followed I think those problems will get reduced if we were to write at the very session beginning of the session we form you know you know groups of teachers who are teaching those papers even if it may be an informal group. But I think if we were to do that, probably a lot of problems that we're all facing may get addressed, is my suggestion. Yes, Shridha. Um, yeah.
Somebody is taking note of all these? Yes. Yeah. 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 Let's focus some more thing on the Indian philosophy and Indian ethics. And other issues, we can talk more. Again, we can discuss, we can make it something. Some specific issues uh, in Indian philosophy which you find particularly pedagogically difficult to communicate with the students. Like for example, see if I can say that you know with Dr. Sahu, she said that Indian philosophy like all methods should be following the critical method. In that case we cannot start with the traditional approach, this tradition is unchallengeable. This, the students won't buy that. So thing is that to make the authority of the Vedas, there is a wonderful paper by Jain Mahanti where he says that why, you know, the authority of the Vedas overpower, I mean, how the reality overpowers uh, the words, something like that, I uh, maybe, that should be, you should start with that, with the clinching arguments that would settle the authority of the Vedas and not with the tradition, oh, bachi ye, tumhari tradition ye follow karna. Now the thing, you know, which all the, many of you have told, I think, don't start with the stereotypical examples like Ghatta and Pata. Use innovative examples. Use absolutely. We we all, yeah we all do. Huh. So I, I would just uh, invite the teachers to come up with specific issues, specific pedagogical problems that you find problem in communication or how to make it practically oriented. As our distinguished speaker has said, if anybody has any concrete suggestion, yes, uh, Doctor Doctor Rekha, yeah. Yes, but to say that how the theories were lived, yes. you have to use, because you cannot live in the classroom, right? Yes. You have to theorize about the, how, how it was lived. So, uh, any other, uh, you know, kind of suggestion? Any other yes. comment? Yeah, Aditya. Yeah, please, Dr. Aditya. No, we all so speak for Indian philosophy. By, what is this? No? My <laughs> is, actually, uh, that can be helpful in uh, the pedagogy. See, uh, what Professor Sahu told us that if you wish to criticize, welcome. But after knowing it, if you criticize, I am I, reminded of one statement given by Raghunath Shiromani, 16th century philosopher, in his commentary of Tattu Chintamani. He said, I like those people who criticize us, but I would be happier if they criticize us without knowing me. So actually, if we include that in our education policy, sir, you were saying that we are looking for a student's definition, we are looking for teacher's definition. Actually, we could not get a time to study our own tradition. In our tradition, there is a definition of student as well. There is a definition of teacher as well. Shankaracharya, Pradharanya Commission's Commentary, he has given a definition of who is a teacher. Prashno Prishat, who is a teacher? Kaka Chesta, Bako Dhyanam, Alpa Hari, Ghehetyagi, Vidyadi Panchalakshadam. So we have enough source in our tradition, but the problem is anything which came from our Indian tradition, we ignored it. I think we should include it in our policy. Then uh, something positive will come out of this tradition as well. And together we can uh, provide something positive to society as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, one, more. one more point also. Most of the time, very much it is romanticizing our tradition.
Yeah, maybe. No, you cannot start with the respect, please. You can. Respecting is a philosophy called in India. We are teaching this respect. These are the systems. There are three countries. There are sutras. There are communities. You know it first. Yes. Then you accept it. Then you start accepting the same. No, no. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, no, see, it's yeah. uh, yeah, so not respecting or disrespecting. Those are any. I want to say like something. Go, uh, uh, uh. Not here to just to say that Indian philosophy. Second, uh, first of all, I will take my example. When I start my first lecture, I make sure that I tell my students, you have to deal on some things. There are things which are being fixed. We are being, you know, oriented in such a way that we think in that particular direction. If it matches us, it is good. If it doesn't match us, it is bad. For example, the example which I give, I say, you, we all say that lion is a violent animal I said how can lion is a violent animal it's his nature he can't eat the mask he can't eat the mask but we are taught like this so first of all what I feel what I am gaining from here is that we have to to some extent decolonize those those things that yes when you come to philosophy jigyasa create karne ki zarurat hai first first that has to be created
they know nothing about Indian philosophy. And total vacuum. Ek yeah. vacuum. No, Indian philosophy is already there in the first semester. So we cannot do anything there. No, no, we are talking about Indian philosophy in this session. You see, I always thought that Indian philosophy should be put to the second or third, which was never done. Basics themselves are very technical. Nibhika ko protection, how can you, how can you relate it to ordinary life? Basic fundamentals of philosophy, 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 the branches. I always thought that Indian philosophy first was the matter of course. But never people never think. Generic divisions. Okay, Simi. Yeah, Dr. Simi, please. Thank you, sir.
Yeah, we'll have our first speaker for the post-lunch session. We welcome you all. Yes, sir. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to express my thanks to Professor Keshav Kumar for giving me this opportunity for presentation as an NEP feedback. So my title, he told me to talk on these teaching modalities of Western and uh, global philosophy. So there are certain topics that I would like to touch upon from this uh, workshop themes, like the philosophy courses and uh, interdisciplinary approach as a pedagogical uh, uh, approach and uh, reception of those reception of those courses uh, in our college and uh, some course material. Okay, next. Okay, reception of courses in philosophy. Uh, what we saw this time uh, for the last two years, especially the courses like uh, constitutional morality and uh, fundamental duties were well accepted by the students and we got uh, multiple batches to teach. But unfortunately this year, uh, as the news was spread in the college, the political science entered into the scenario and they claimed that uh, paper. Then we were left with just one batch, the other batches were taken by them. So our workload got decreased. Last year we uh, had two guests, this year we couldn't appoint even one guest. So in this case I would like to suggest to Professor Keshav Kumar that uh, since these courses like words like a constitution, duties claimed by other departments, if we have a paper like a philosophy of constitution as a core course, so that uh, uh, we can claim as our own paper, so including it into core course, otherwise other departments will snatch it. That will be one way how, ke how can we keep our workload uh, in place. Okay, next. okay reception, of, uh, reception of courses. This is the case with uh, BA honors, as you all know very well that uh, uh, when we go in, in up, in the semester, the core courses are coming down and DSC papers are going uh, up. Uh, um, DSC papers are also going more in number, but students get an opportunity to switch to uh, GE of other departments. So what happened? We lost two papers like uh, philosophy of mind and uh, fundamentals uh, and, and uh, uh, contemporary Indian philosophy, both in GE and uh, DSE, because other students did not opt our paper and our student went to other departments. Uh, that uh, happened. The reason I found that uh, the students, the freshers coming from plus two level, they are not able to understand what philosophy is. They, they are scared of this. They think that this is something kind of uh, alien subject. So I would suggest that if we could introduce at a plus two level that uh, at least the Indian philosophy subject, Indian philosophy be introduced, that uh, scenario might get changed. Uh, this is also in BA program. BA program, all the year it happens, student opt only for minor. They don't opt for major. In that way also we are losing uh, workload. Then I started to do in the orientation uh, when the student come as uh, freshers. This is a good subject for uh, civil service. So some bo majority of boys uh, started to show, show some interest towards uh, philosophy. For example, in civil service, there are main papers. Uh, their main paper deals with the topics, uh, subjects like Indian philosophy, Western philosophy, philosophy of language, philosophy of religion. Then in ethics, there are ethics and ethical, eth environmental ethics, bioethics. Then another paper in civil service, technology and society. 
then one of the major concern of civil service aspirants is Indian constitution. So if we highlight these kinds of subjects uh, in the uh, syllabus, then we might get, might be able to attract uh, more students to our discipline. Then another issue is related to metaphysics. Uh, and I am supposed to speak about uh, Western metaphysics or Western philosophy and uh, in a global perspective. In this case, what philosophy has got an, an, an outlook that it is somewhere in air, nothing rooted to the grounds and very highly speculative and not very practical. But I have seen in Western f philosophy, it is always related to uh, uh, ground that it is a scientific, it has got a scientific rooting. For example, Heidegger's friendship with uh, Max, Planck, the, Max Planck, the founder of uh, quantum physics. So we can have such a pedagogical approach that it is not completely in the air or totally speculative, rather, rather uh, that uh, some kind of uh, speculations revolving around the data are involved in, in philosophy, even in metaphysics. Uh, like that, we, if we can have a course like metaphysics and the science. Uh, we have Indian, Indian philosophy, one concept, uh, from which the word Brahman is evolved. Brahman means to expand, to grow, to evolve eternally. And this was an age-old uh, concept invented by the Indian sages sitting in under the tree or in their cave. But it is only in the 20th century the scientists came to discover that the universe is expanding. The expansion is going on. And what are the forces behind it? Like dark energy, dark matter. This way, if we give a perspective to metaphysics, the students may not get uh, so much alarmed that it is completely... Uh, um, uh, in the, uh, speculative and then we have Indian concept another uh, Indian philosophy another concept Maya so you can see the 2022 Nobel Prize uh, that uh, um, proves the illusory nature of the world then I, I was teaching Sartre's book Being and Nothingness in that he has got the definition of what is the subject as the other and he says, uh, the drain hole. So that is also related to what in cosmology they say the black hole. According to Sartre, the black holes are there already upon earth. That is nothing but the subject. And he says that the world is not flowing into nothingness and the world is not flowing out of itself. Rather, the world is flowing through the drain hole. So he considered the subject as, it, this is just an example how we can uh, root onto uh, scientific understanding. Then if we take the concept of subjectivism that is started from Bishop Berkeley, we always uh, blame all those people to making mentalism or subjectivism. But we can also uh, correlate with, uh, with the theory of relativity or measurement problem in quantum physics because objectively there, there is only wave function. Only when you measure, it collapses into a particle. That is double slit experiment, the delayed uh, experiment. Uh, that experiment shows that if there is a possibility that you are going to know the result, then, the pa then this wave function will collapse into a particle to show you that I am here. You can measure me. So that we can say metaphysics are as related to the new concepts like a mirror universe, parallel universe, multiverse, all these concepts in physics. Then this is also another interdisciplinary approach related to consciousness, where we can teach consciousness in a very uh, fresh new pedagogi pedagogical approach, philosophy of consciousness and uh, artificial intelligence. Because now there is an issue, are, are the machines conscious? Did they start to think that MIT professor's book, Max Tegmark? So he speaks about the 10 stages of artificial intelligence. And I would like to uh, just uh, show how this is related to the problem of consciousness. 
the first stage it was uh, rule based ai that we nowadays keep thermostat at our home so when the temperature rise it automatically switch on the ac now in the second generation we came to the context based ai that is working on the principle of retention and suggestion suggestion yeah yeah as an interdisciplinary approach in order to make the philosophical theories more factually grounded or rooted into empirical reality otherwise metaphysics always mistaken as something an alien type of enterprise okay. oh, yeah, yeah 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 oh okay uh, that is max tegmar uh, the mit professor like his life 3.0 3.0 uh, then this uh, the second generation context based that is working on the principle of retention and it was uh, john locke who said that uh, the mind is not just a mirror but it is the mirror that has power to retain so that principle is working in the ai and we use uh, amazon's alexa or apple's siri or google assistant uh, it is based on they have this ability to retain and work on past experiences then the third generation ai came as narrow domain ai that is deep minds uh, alpha alpha go that can the most complicated game in the world is go and there are ai who can beat all the world champions then the fourth generation came rational ai that is working on llm that is lang large language model what they are doing they are just making the hu uh, mimicking the human brain the neural uh, connection they they are making the connection in the machine of all the linguistic network and no so far no neuroscientist is able to Uh, understand how these neural connections in human brain are making the recognition of patterns it is still unknown and it is the same case in artificial intelligence also how these language network connections are uh, making the pattern recognition and uh, they are doing things what they are not taught we did not teach them anything but they are do doing things for example these Uh, uh, the company called open ai is chat gpt and uh, elon musk uh, Tes tesla companies uh, driverless cars all, all these things then in the next fifth generation now it is going to start that is uh, altman's company uh, sam altman's open ai he is seeking for the 7 trillion investment 7 trillion investment means it is the more than double than the gdp of india it is more than the investment of both apple and google put together and they are saying that that will start to do all type of functioning it is just like uh, you are dealing with your teenage kid you he starts to learn uh, himself and if you pedal with him he can become naughty uh, that is the fifth stage and now they are saying that in the sixth stage it will go into the self evolving state that uh, you they it it does not need any human input it will evolve on itself and uh, that is the case uh, elon musk is working with his uh, tesla that he is planning to import his cars all over the world so that they collect the data and one car make a mistake not only that car learns that car never make a mistake again but the whole car of tesla will correct that mistake they will never make do uh, do that mistake that is the evolving state of the super ai then the seventh stage is predicted that it is self awareness ai that it comes to aware of comes to be aware of its own existence and its own capabilities and that is what is predicted as that it might slip human control then in the eighth stage it will go into a transcendent ai where it will start to connect other forms of consciousness 
that will be something like a phenomenological quasi transcendent and consciousness of life world where the machines enter into the human life world then in the ninth stage it is cosmic ai after connecting with all forms of consciousness it will start to merge with this um, uh, all material forms that is from quantum to cosmos then in the 10th stage uh, it is predicted that pro possibly it will be the last stage that is the uh, absolute ai that it can even merge with uh, higher dimensions higher dimensions of the reality where we might see it as has become a god like ai uh global philosophy okay uh, f at present we have only this uh, european philosophy or american philosophy but we don't get uh, other type of philosophers for example russian chinese korean japanese african philosophy uh, for example nelson mandela or arabian philosophy and uh, latin american philosophy all these sections we miss in our syllabus okay no? now uh, this deconstruction of uh, metaphysics what i find missing in this uh, syllabus that uh, many students find it very difficult for example when they read being and time of martin heidegger they take this word being a, into a traditional understanding of being but actually heidegger man, meant exactly the opposite he was the one who started the project destruction of metaphysics which uh, later developed by derrida into deconstruction of metaphysics so there is a zenith of modernity or zenith of metaphysics that is husserl's absolute presence that uh, he delivered in his internal time consciousness uh, lecture which is edited by heidegger and uh, published so this has become the climax of the metaphysics of presence after which uh, all these people like uh, sartre heidegger or derrida paul de man they were trying to deconstruct that so the project actually started by heidegger in being and time uh, which was which was actually based on this internal time consciousness of husserl but our students read that text in a completely distorted manner they don't understand so this mis mis misreading can be avoided by introducing this uh, derrida's essay called uh, difference in of grammatology okay then uh, then i am not supposed to speak about indian philosophy however i just uh, see that there are so many other philosophers we are missing in the syllabus like uh, periyar tiruvalluvar phule kabir karunagara guru sri narayana guru there are Uh, then others then uh, this i okay however i will say that if time is left if, uh, the the most uh, recent is so should i uh, skip it okay okay uh, thank you very much thank you so much now i invite the next speaker uh, dr pa saba parveen and mansi rana from kamla nehru college they'll be speaking on introducing philosophy and fundamental concepts
head of department, esteemed chair of the session, fellow professors, and uh, one and all present here. A very good afternoon. Uh, since much has already been discussed in the earlier sessions, uh, most in the morning session by two of our esteemed guests, and uh, more in the sessions in the form of questions and answers, we have already discussed much. So I will keep my presentation very precise. Um, I will be briefly discussing the objectives, scope, and the unique offerings on the NEP paper titled Introduction to Philosophy and Fundamentals of Philosophy. Uh, along with my reflection on these papers, I will also include some of the challenges that I faced while teaching these papers. So to begin with, these papers start with an inquiry into the why of philosophy. This why point, uh, this why point has also been emphasized by Professor Jayashri uh, Mathur in uh, the morning session that she did already talk about the importance of uh, developing interest of the students as to what is the purpose of philosophy and why they are pursuing the subject. So these papers hence foster a deep understanding of why it is important to engage with philosophical inquiry in the first place. At the same time, grasping its uniqueness and how philosophical inquiry is different from the inquiries conducted in other disciplines like sciences, like theologies, etc. So I believe that honors students, because uh, these papers have been introduced as core to the uh, be honors. So I, will, uh, I believe that honors students through these core papers delve deeply into the specialized areas of philosophy, such as metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, social political, and the history of philosophical thought. These papers aim to cultivate a holistic understanding of the discipline from its elementary level, enabling students to engage with pertinent questions that lie at the heart of the discipline of philosophy. These papers also critically engage with the biases inherent in the attitudes of the Occidental West against the Oriental philosophies. How it reduces, how, how the Occidents reduce the Oriental tradition to mythology and theology. Although this point has already been highlighted by uh, Professor Singh, uh, uh, Professor R. P. Singh, uh, in the morning session, but uh, um, when he talked about richness of Indian concepts like Anvikshiki, Darshan, Manan Chintan, and other similar concepts that emphasize on uh, the aspect of Indian traditions. Uh, though these papers, through these papers, the pursuit of philosophy has undergone a significant transformation. By moving away from the traditional way of doing philosophy, departing from the conventional methods, these papers delve into the problems of philosophy in a non-traditional manner emphasizing more over the practical utility of philosophical thinking. Therefore, the new curriculum aims to foster a genuine interest in the subject, encouraging intellectual curiosity and active participation of the students. I also believe that the content of these papers have become more substantial and more profound with the introduction of rigorous and insightful primary and secondary texts, leading to the prominent philosophical debates. Moreover, by emphasizing the practical utility of the philosophical thinking, these papers address a common challenge faced in the past, thereby helping students understand the usefulness of the subject, thus making philosophical inquiry more accessible and relevant to their academic and uh, personal pursuits. Now teaching these papers also present a set of challenges for the teachers, the educators. So I would like to share a few challenges that I personally experienced and uh, uh, faced 
uh, while teaching these papers. Firstly, so moving away from the traditional perspective and methodology in which we educators are conditioned to pursue philosophy, which also make it difficult to adopt to the evolving needs of the new curriculum and to be more practical uh, with the philosophy. Another significant challenge faced by teachers is the designing and implementing of the assessment methods, including continuous assessments, coming up with the assessments that are both creatively and philosophically stimulating, which can further enable students to unlock their hidden philosophical caliber. Furthermore, the duration of the semester may sometimes seem insufficient to cover the content of the paper effectively. This constraint can create pressure to prioritize certain topics or to rush through the material, potentially compromising the quality of the learning. So despite these obstacles, we have observed a noticeable increase in students' interest and their fondness for the discipline in comparison to the student from the previous batches. So I sincerely wish that this transformation benefits not just students, but also us as professors, educators, teachers, and motivating us to become a better and improved version of ourselves. Thank you so much. So as we all know, the world is evolving at breakneck speed and education needs to keep pace. The students need to be equipped with more than just knowledge. They need essential life skills, ethical values and critical thinking abilities to thrive in this complex and interconnected society. Recognizing this crucial need, the NEP introduced innovative skill enhancement courses and value added courses to empower students fostering the very skills necessary to become a well-rounded individual and responsible citizen. I'll briefly present the objectives, unique offerings, and my reflections on the SEC course offered by our college. So at Kamala Nehru College, the philosophy department is breaking new ground with its SEC paper communication in everyday life. This progressive approach departs from traditional methods. Next slide. Emphasizing the importance of equipping students with essential communication skills for success in a rapidly evolving world. With the focus on following objectives, I believe this course grants us an opportunity to revolutionize the way philosophy is taught and its impact on students' lives. Firstly, practical relevance. Traditionally, philosophy has been perceived as abstract and disconnected from everyday life. This course bridges philosophy with everyday life, showing how philosophical ideas can enhance real-world communication skills. Secondly, unlike traditional lecture-based approaches, this SEC paper fosters active student engagement through interactive discussions, experiential learning, and practical assignments. Moreover, by offering this course, we demonstrate our commitment to evolving educational landscapes, equipping students with current skills vital for future success. Next slide. Now, additionally, we observe that this paper aligns perfectly with our department's ethos and expertise. Firstly, as we all know that philosophy encourages introspection and self-reflection, qualities essential for effective communication. So through philosophical inquiry, students can deepen their understanding of themselves as communicators and enhance their ability to express their thoughts and ideas clearly and persuasively. Secondly, Learning communication through a philosophical lens fosters critical thinking. It grants students the opportunity to analyze arguments, identify fallacies, and evaluate the effectiveness of different modes of communication. 
lastly communication is not merely a neutral exchange of um, information but is inherently imbued with ethical implications through philosophical inquiry students get the opportunity to explore the ethical dimensions of communication next slide now i will briefly mention how i imbibe these points in my pedagogical method my journey began by laying the philosophical foundation drawing on the necessity and inherent complexity of language as explored in disciplines like philosophy of language we delved in how communication transcends mere needs venturing into poetry drama argumentation and deliberation showcasing the richness and power of expression i also introduced the historical significance of socratic dialogue highlighting its continued relevance in fostering active listening and questioning within everyday interactions this is the material that i refer to next slide bridging the gap between theory and practice i integrated logic lessons in the curriculum we explored various fallacies equipping students with tools to critically evaluate arguments especially those encountered in persuasive media like advertisements through real life world examples students actively identified and discussed fallacies gaining a deeper understanding of the importance of sound reasoning in daily life next embracing a critical lens we explored the persuasive sorry pervasive influence of gender stereotypes and their impact on communication Simone de Beauvoir's second sex provided a framework for analyzing how early medias like cartoons reinforced these stereotypes to challenge these narratives students embarked on a creative journey rewriting fairy tales with a twisted perspective encouraging critical thinking and questioning established norms we even explored the art of rhetoric and its impact on public speaking classic works like plato's gorgias provided context followed by discussions on modern uh, persuasion techniques recognizing the power of visuals we dedicated a class to visual communication iconic pieces like allegory of the cave the beetle in the box and the duck rabbit illusion so that springboards for storytelling and interpretation through analysis and creation students grasped how imagery allegories and metaphors simplify complex concepts and enhance communication i even remember one of my experiences where a student gave a very interesting feminist interpretation of the allegory of the cave now coming on to the challenges i think one of the challenges is to accommodate various perspectives because students come from all sorts of different backgrounds in in second back courses so sometimes it's difficult to accommodate all uh, different perspectives and secondly i think that because um, we are not really engaging with the discipline rigorously so it it's sometimes it can be a little demotivating for the teacher if, himself or herself that uh, you know you you are dealing with the subject only at a superficial level on really not getting into the analytic rigor of the discipline as such so nonetheless the positive feedback from the students and their demonstrably improved skills validated this innovative approach witnessing students connect philosophical ideas to daily situations was incredibly gratifying hence i believe that a course like this grants us an opportunity to explore unique ways to bridge the gap between philosophy and everyday life empowering individuals not only to become uh, more effective communicators but insightful thinkers as well thank you and see i think that was very insightful thank you so much now I invite the next speaker dr rekha namneet she'll be speaking on applied ethics and art appreciation a very good afternoon to one and all and uh, thank you professor kesav for asking me to give some presentation but then i checked with him that am i going to be giving a presentation as in presentation but then he assured me that it is going to be like a 
discussion. So there is no hardcore presentation as such. And most of the things about uh, philosophy as a discipline bridging the gap between the real life situations and uh, the academic uh, reflections has been just talked about. So I take from there, from the previous speakers and from the speakers in the morning. So uh, basically I thought that I'll talk about some bit of the necessity for applying philosophy in daily life situations, but uh, the previous uh, speaker in this session has already touched upon that by bringing in everything that is necessary for having philosophy in daily life situations and uh, Mansi also just touched upon that and very eloquently. So my take will be very, very brief and uh, I'll largely be more interested in the axiological part that is ethics and aesthetics. And the reason is that while ethics has really gained currency and has been very favorite among the policy makers as far as curriculum is concerned, but aesthetics somehow gets a very stepmotherly treatment in most of the universities. So I don't understand the reason why when it is part of axiology. So that is going to be one uh, just request and also something for uh, tabling the discussion. So applied uh, philosophy, I won't add much except that it stands as a beacon illuminating the intricate connection between abstract ideas and concrete realities and far from being an armchair activity, being limited to just corridors of academia, it can bear direct relevance to everyday life. This guide aims to simplify, I mean this is like to simplify the complex facets of applied philosophy and which can be applicable to all and as I said that Professor Babu has already touched upon most of the things. So the basic thing is that if we talk of philosophy as an applied thing, largely we have to look at theory, contextualization and praxis. And we were told by Professor Shekhar in the morning that uh, we need to look at not from uh, theory to practice, but practice to theory. But uh, just as a humble suggestion, I would suggest that we can look at both the things or we can negotiate both the things, that theory to practice and practice to theory, which should or which may probably make classrooms at enlightening. So one uh, suggestion is that, and that is only for suggestion. Now I come to two fields of uh, philosophy, which are very, very relevant as applied philosophical streams. One, of course, is ethics, which is really recognized and specifically applied ethics. And the other is aesthetics. Another suggestion, since it is uh, going to be a matter of discussion and uh, we are talking about curriculum pedagogy, so most of it is uh, given in the curriculum. So in the curriculum of applied ethics, we have almost like, uh, we have uh, introduction, and in the introduction, we are supposed to be giving uh, a very brief introduction to what is ethics. And the thing is that what happens is this is a core paper. So the students in the first, year, that is in the second semester, have already done a bit of, or not a bit, they have read core paper of ethics. So I suppose that instead of just saying that introduction, we could just move on to the next step, since we have positive of time while doing our lectures and uh, teaching. So what we could do is that how these concepts which they have studied can be applied and we need to emphasize more on the dilemmas and problems in the real life situation so as to set in the tone of this paper. But unfortunately, at the moment, in the syllabus, we don't have this uh, scope. So we are just given very, uh, I mean, uh, I should not say brashly, but we have just been given in a very uh, surface-like manner, introduction, basic concepts, and uh, dilemmas and problems, whereas we have not been given any time to discuss what dilemmas and problems are. We are, I mean, our students have been acquainted with the basic theories. And even among the basic theories, what happens is that we don't give them any chance to read the con contemporary theories, for instance, casistry ethics and care ethics, which should become the part of the knowledge system to start with what is applied ethics, because these two kinds of approaches are most suitable to applied ethics 
taking cues from whatever they have done in the traditional ethical systems, the three main ethical systems that they have done, which is uh, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, and deontological system. Another suggestion, just as a suggestion, is that we could actually break this paper uh, and make a couple of papers which will be attractive for DSE courses. For example, in the unit four, we have professional ethics and public policy. Where in professional ethics, we just discuss medical ethics and we discuss surrogacy, euthanasia, and doctor patient relationship. Now, these topics need a full scope of theory and a full score of paper. So, why can't we have a biomedical ethics paper and that would be an attractive paper for DSC? rather than just making it as a G, because what happens is that uh, one of the earlier panelists had also pointed out that uh, G, when it is a G paper, we lose out on the, uh, we lose out on the teaching uh, uh, assignments because G is meant for people outside the philosophy discipline and most of them because they are not acquainted with the philosophy, so they don't come to philosophy and we, our students already lose out. And it also doesn't make sense to just jump from medical ethics to privacy, the public interest and purian public in media ethics. So we could have media ethics and just not media ethics, just not the printing press because that's an old age thing, not even electronic media. Now we have social media, we have digitized media. So why can't we have another full paper on media ethics? And we could also have a full paper as Professor Babu had suggested, why not on technology and ethics or the contemporary AI, AI and ethics? Is there? Yeah, right. But is it uh, for the DSC? We have AI component also. Uh, but is it for D? DSC? That is what my point is, ki make these papers as DSC. No, uh, that is the problem. No, because our students don't come and students go to G, the students coming to G don't take because of the scare of philosophy. So that is one point. So this was about applied ethics. Now my another worry is that aesthetics has actually been left out from most of the uh, curriculum uh, policies because I remember one of the teachers in many years ago commenting, no, this is a periphery subject, who is it for it? Jabki part of axiology, with the traditional axiology is that we do ethics, we do aesthetics, agathos and okalos, and besides that we do social and political philosophy. So why can't we have aesthetics and aesthetics has the widest reach for applied philosophy? And if we read out the syllabus of aesthetics, for instance, it is one of the best syllabi that we have had. So, uh, and we can make a, uh, a little bit of correction in it, but that having said, we can definitely connect. We have uh, one unit on axiological aspects, so it becomes very difficult for students who, and uh, among DSE again, because uh, at the moment again, it is one of the DSE not being offered by many colleges, because it was never a popular kind of a thing. So to tell them that there is something called a component of ethics and aesthetics which can go hand in hand even in the understanding. For example, Hiryana uh, has very nicely and pertinently stated it that the uh, route to Sat is to, through detachment and detachment in ethics is selfless action and detachment in aesthetics is disinterested approach. So why can't we take these two and have full-fledged papers? So th those are just my humble submissions. And the house is open for discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. No, we have one more speaker before yes. we keep, uh, make it open for the discussion. Dr. Shraddha Shah from Gargi College. No, I'm from Gargi. Okay. I'm from Gargi. Okay. She'll be speaking on issues in social and political philosophy. Reporting, just introduce yourself. Am I audible? Uh, I'm, yeah. All right. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Shraddha Shah from Lady Shriram College. 
uh, I'm uh, presenting uh, a general pedagogical, uh, I mean, most of this is basically my reflections on uh, teaching social and political philosophy. Um, I uh, thank the department for initiating this uh, and you know allowing us this platform to engage in a discussion on pedagogy because all of us here are well versed with what philosophy is and uh, what is it that we need to teach by way of content uh, but I think primarily what we are here to discuss is how is it that we are going to do it and uh, that has become a major concern for us. Uh, first issue is of course uh, the issue of time. Uh, earlier we were functioning with five lectures each uh, for each uh, course largely, now we reduced to three and our syllabus uh, still has a lot of very difficult and uh, uh, you know core readings which the students aren't acquainted with. Some of these issues have already been uh, brought up uh, so I'm not going to take time to address those. Uh, I want to get to a very precise and particular sort of presentation where I want to discuss the syllabus of social and political philosophy and I want to address two issues by way of that. Uh, one is how do we approach the syllabus given the time constraints, uh, what are the key issues perhaps that we can discuss and I'm only uh, stating my s submission or my suggestions with regards to it. So it's obviously open to everyone else. I'm sure there are a lot of people here who've taught it and perhaps can enrich this by, um, you know, uh, pointing out how they approached it. So that's one part of what I want to discuss. The other part is with regards to student experience. Uh, because given CUET, uh, given the fact that students are no longer acquainted with, I mean, are not acquainted with philosophy in the same way, and when they're coming to sec uh, the third semester where they study social and political philosophy, uh, their introduction is not the same as what it used to be earlier. Uh, given these considerations, how do we communicate to the students, how do we get our uh, theories and concepts through to them? And, you know, without fully, uh, without, uh, you know, uh, completely diluting what we're getting at. So we want some degree of, um, you know, communication through with them, but we also don't want it to become, uh, you know, something which means nothing. I mean, there should be both rigor and depth with regards to what we're saying. Uh, the other thing which I want to point out with regards to social and political philosophy is uh, that, I mean, for other disciplines in philosophy, perhaps there is a concern with interdisciplinarity, but with social and political philosophy, the problem is the other way around, that you already do have political theory, you already do have sociological theories which address a lot of the things that we do. Uh, so there is a way in which when we're teaching social and political philosophy, uh, we need to address what is it that philosophy is bringing in uh, to the discussion. Uh, and, and that becomes an issue because students have already done political theory or and I, as far as I understand there's a GE as well which is offered by way of uh, political theory by the political science department. So uh, there we need to somewhere be able to show uh, the philosophical insight that we have. So uh, first things first I want to go over the syllabus and uh, discuss how we can uh, you know engage uh, with the details of that and then uh, maybe take some discussions in terms of how to introduce it to the students. So uh, the first unit uh, that we do is basically, and, and I'm discussing the honors paper right now, I'm not discussing uh, the BA program paper. If that's something that someone wants to take up, then we can probably have it in the Q&A. Uh, so the first one is understanding political philosophy, uh, basic concepts. That's the first unit that we address, and we are allocated about two weeks for doing that, uh, which essentially means uh, six lectures. So however these six lectures pan out, uh, the idea, at least as far as I understand, I think the basic uh, thing that I was trying to uh, discuss that how do we differentiate, our, differentiate ourselves from political theory exclusively or sociological theory exclusively. I think this is the paper and the discussion where we can bring in the idea of how political philosophy as we're doing it by philosophy is different. And I think the reading that we've been allocated by Strauss is a good um, framework for doing it. Uh, the idea is that here, um, you know, when we're addressing the students, uh, bringing in certain fundamental philosophical concepts and the larger overview of philosophy by way of which we are approaching politics, I think that's the key issue. Because again, this reading is not, uh, you know, very concise reading. I think it's about uh, 20 odd pages or something like that. And uh, we, we don't have the luxury anymore of going through everything, you know, line by line. So here, I think one of the key issues that we ought to discuss is uh, the orientation by way of which we can approach uh, social and political philosophy. 
particularly you know how philosophy approaches the larger discipline so that's my submission and uh, other than then the next uh, unit that we approach is uh, modern liberal thought uh, and here we have quite a few readings so uh, we have uh, kant's uh, enlightenment we have uh, locke's um, uh, we have three sections from locke's uh, two treatises and we have john rawls um, now here again what i find uh, useful is both a conceptual analysis as well as a certain kind of historical contextualization because with regards to liberal thought even though it's the dominant framework within which we live now but uh, there is a different uh, historical basis to the way uh, politics is so i i think uh, here we need to you know sort of balance out between giving history of the particular philosophers of the particular movements as well as some sort of conceptual rigor in terms of uh, how we introduce them to the enlightenment how we introduce them to liberal thought how we introduce them to uh, slavery at least in the way in which it's discussed in locke uh, for again these readings are still concise if you look at enlightenment it's it's a fairly short reading as well as the sections that have been taken up from locke uh, they fairly short but when you come to say rolls that's that's a big reading that's again about 30 odd pages uh we can't go over that in detail personally i found uh, making a ppt very useful uh with regards to rolls but uh, i mean again that's up to each teacher and how they sort of approach it uh because just laying it out in terms of the fundamental ideas uh and and their interrelations somehow helps to address rolls as opposed to go over everything in detail um the next unit that we have and this is a new one which is on uh, the limits of uh, modern western political thought where we have the reading by hannah arendt again a fairly difficult reading uh, also hannah arendt herself as a philosopher uh, very hard to teach to undergrads who are first being introduced to it so here again i think some sort of historical uh, contextualization of how she herself has approached this is useful before you sort of get to the reading uh, i think there's a, a suggestion of a, you know a youtube film in the suggested uh, column so i think that's something we can take recourse to in order to contextualize it because uh, the whole idea of di discussing a totalitarian state is uh, you know the problem that comes in with absolute obedience and and for that we have sort of uh, suggested a movie in the syllabus so i think it's a good way to approach uh, uh, the text i mean the the reading itself other than that we have again the section on indian uh, political thought now here uh, i think it's very important when this question sort of has been coming up over and over again in terms of you know how do we talk about indian philosophy do we need a distinction between indian and western and uh, you know we can't quite deny it that we uh, we don't need it it's not just the concepts but it's context uh, concepts placed in particular concept uh, context in a, in a historical sort of way and especially the readings that we have uh, you know in terms of gandhi ambedkar uh, uh, tagore and mn roy all four thinkers uh, who have been put as part of the syllabus have something uh, unique to offer from the perspective of uh, the indian experience uh, you know whether it's in terms of colonialism or uh, you know it's in terms of the caste issue uh, or it's uh, tagore's critique of uh, nationalism and especially his critique of the larger western idea of nationalism i think it's important to perhaps begin with uh, an understanding of how indian political thought is uh, responding to some of the traditional ideas of political philosophy and political theory so um, i i think it's good to perhaps uh, at least begin with that sort of orientation and then take on the uh, readings that we have uh, again you know there will obviously be paucity of time in terms of addressing each of these readings because we i think uh, we allocated some four weeks for this but uh, I, i i don't think it's it will be possible to address everything as a whole um so that's something i wanted to discuss by way of um the syllabus that we have uh the other issue is in terms of uh, student experience now another th the thing that we found is that uh, you know students are not any more coming to delhi university only from elite backgrounds right where they already have uh, a prior knowledge of what is it uh, i mean or, or if they've read any philosophical texts or if they've uh, already engaged with things we we obviously have to take into account uh, you know issues of language now and we need to have material ready in uh, in order to offer it to students who are no longer uh, you know acquainted with the the readings that we have and i think that becomes a big problem so uh, i i honestly have no solutions for that 
uh, but I do want to submit it to uh, the group present here if, if there are suggestions of what we can do about it. That's definitely welcome. Uh, the other issue is also that, you know, uh, social political philosophy brings up very polarizing issues. Uh, it brings up issues where uh, there's a lot of debate uh, outside in the uh, public forum. And, and I think uh, somewhere as teachers, we need to be able to open up those debates uh, in the classroom and uh, allow a dialogue to emerge on that. And uh, that, I think, is the most significant bit because uh, I remember at least, I mean, it's not uh, limited to this syllabus, but I remember when we had feminism as part of the social political philosophy uh, syllabus, uh, we had a student uh, uh, who had come from, you know, rural area in Rajasthan and when we were discussing is issues of intersectionality and the body and so on and so forth, uh, he was completely at a loss. And uh, his questions used to come off as very aggressive, as asking, like, what, what does it really mean? But uh, I think the larger issue there was also that it's also different life worlds, different life experiences which are coming together in the classroom space, uh, but we need to be able to facilitate a dialogue and, and sort of have that assumption that, uh, you know, not everyone's coming from the same place. So again, how we do that is a difficult and a challenging thing, but that I think is a very important part of pedagogy, especially in something like social and political philosophy. So uh, these were some of my submissions. Uh, the rest is open to the house. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shada. I think you could put it very succinctly in a very short span of time. So I think in this session we have had, we have covered a wide range of, I mean a wide canvas has been covered right from modalities of Western and global philosophy to introducing philosophy and fundamental concepts. Also we have touched upon applied ethics and the other very important aspect, axiology, which is sort of being missed out and we should be addressing it and issues in social and political philosophy. And I totally, totally agree with you that it should be open to debates, even when we are talking in terms of applied ethics. And that's where we generally lack between the theory and the practice. I think this is where we are also losing relevance for philosophy because sometimes it is considered to be just confined to the classes and discussions and arguments and we don't go anywhere from here. And that's why I think this weakness also needs to be addressed. Having said this, because you know the experiences are coming out from our esteemed uh, college teachers, so I'll open the discussion for 10 minutes, and after that, I promise you a good warm cup of tea. So 10 minutes of discussion on this, yeah. Any kind of incorporation is possible. I'll request all the teachers to first give their names because they are also taking note of the uh, observations coming in. So that will be very helpful if you can just give your name and then give your suggestions. Yeah.
Yes, ma'am. Your name, ma'am, please. I'm Roshni. So I have my colleague Amit, Amit Kumar Pradhan. So he, I, I know that he has translated many of, uh, because our college, we get lots of Hindi medium students. To teach them philosophy in English is a challenge. So he has been making these translations. Uh, last time also, we have suggested that if he can make a core group of teachers who are ready to help no. us out. And we can make a, a whole manual uh, and then we can just kind of circulate it in different ways. I think that will be very helpful for students from a very, very helpful, yeah. Yeah.
सुहासनी बारी go one by one i think let's go one by one so that we can take note of the suggestions i would request to uh, say one by one so that we can take note down of all the suggestions yeah yeah so uh, in general to respond to what you're saying ma'am maybe it's a good idea that uh, you know we form committees or subgroups for all the various papers there are and have a sort of discussion on these issues of how we can you know so people who've taught those papers kind of get their ideas together and then we can circulate it among all the other faculty members who are not present here or something like that but we'll have to formalize that right now because since everyone's here already yeah
they are supposed to make projects on, for instance, two topics. One uh, group will make on one and the other group will make on the other. And they, so we have four units. So one group will make on two units and another group will make on another two units. And then there will be an interchange to presentation. So what happens is that both the, uh, both the things get uh, satisfied. One is that tutorial is attended. And secondly, that they have an exchange of ideas for students, all the students. So for instance, in a class of 40, 20 students are doing first two units and other 20 are doing the third and fourth unit. And when they do the presentation, they have an exchange of ideas. So in that sense, they get, uh, I mean, they get ready for the exam purpose also. And they get ready also to have that clear kind of a thing among senses and they also attend the field. So this is our way of doing the CA, at least of four days. Okay, now we'll just take the last question, the last, the last observation from Irshad. We, we have to break for tea. We'll have to break for tea. So we'll just take the last suggestion from Irshad. Yeah. I think if we all agree, okay, the last, the last means the final last, okay. <laughs> no, last.
या ओके तो वी कैन इंक्लूड दोज थिंग्स राइट वही वही आई थिंक वो सजेशन कि हमें एक अपनी एक कोर कमेटी बनाए उसमें दीज दीज एक्सचेंज ऑफ आइडियाज कैन हैपन आई रिक्वेस्ट टू हॉल टू ज्वाइन फॉर टी एंड विल असेंबल आफ्टर टेन मिनट्स टेन मिनट्स या आफ्टर टी थैंक यू
We have uh, Ms. Namrata from Atlantic Publishers. So she would just like to speak to us for uh, five minutes about our publication needs, like if somebody is working on a book or on, on the syllabus. syllabus okay. Yeah, so if you have something, uh, all, some material already with you or you want to develop some material, then she is the right person to contact. Yeah, so, uh, no. No, as you told, na, this is we want to develop the publishing the test book, that is the immediate priority. Then we have the plan that it is uh, some kind of department can be mediate some kind of uh, general leadership. Under that one, we can mediate the who are the people engaged with this uh, particular um, paper, and we can identify the uh, size six and paper people who are each one they can share the one chapter, and that level we can work out collectively can work out. And also, we before that we can think about the moralities. What is there, and we will our primary base is that our material, whatever the syllabus it is there, and we won't confine to that same material it is there. But we like to consult the secondary sources and also some background for that one. How students friendly material, how to make the things very simple, and such level we can have the discussion on that one in the later period. And also what is requirement and all. Also they try to look for the, even the translations of the both say, same text can be. They can self engage or ourself also can do that one translate into the Hindi and all. Huh? Now I requested the Atlantic publishers, you know, the very established publishers. Now they have the big network also. All the other major international publications also, now they are doing distribution. And uh, they are very good. Now they want to, very eager, they are looking for the textbook publications they are then I told them the department it is there department it is nearly um, every year at least minimum thousand uh, people now our textbook preparation not only confined to the BA the test you are writing suppose applied ethics you are writing or Indian philosophy writing we can keep in aim of the MA also since four year course and that level we can make it much more standard kind of test we can prepare it and all uh, now um, we, we should definitely uh, we will we'll let us see how far we will succeed but at least seven eight books immediately by next year we can easily get out we can get it to publish and with their active support they are very much eager to come forward to do this kind of thing now I request she is Nam Nam Namrata, Namrata, na? Namrata is uh, she is uh, commissioning editor for the Atlantic publishers yeah. Hello all, uh, thank you Professor Kumar for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so yeah, Atlantic has been in the business since 1977. We are exclusive distribution partner for Rotledge, Sage and Oxford now. Uh, this is very recent for us but we have captured all the market and we are now expanding our publishing side. I was with Sage before I came to Atlantic so obviously I have, we have pulled in a lot of Sage authors to Atlantic now. Um, a lot of these are Rumki Basu, the one international politics, Abhijit Kundu, Professor Abhijit Kundu from um, sociology. So now this is, uh, we met Professor Kumar and we discussed like we would really want to publish a lot of, um, I mean we are really into textbook market and we would like to bring out uh, textbooks and philosophy undergraduate, postgraduate reference reads as well, um, as well as translations. I mean, we would want uh, Indian author translated works. Um, that is what we're interested in. Um, distribution is not an issue for us. Making sure the book is available globally is not an issue for us. Um, Atlantic has really deep reaches. I mean, it's, you already know. So uh, yeah, so the process is very simple. Um, we would want certain papers, certain proposal that can be, th I will distribute my card to everyone. Uh, please reach out to me. And uh, the, the process is very quick also. Um, the approval is very quick. Agreement is signed very quickly. And we bring out the books in three to four months time. So uh, we'll be able to make the book available as per your schedule. Uh, any other questions? I'm gonna. Uh, we have a catalog here as well. Individual manuscripts also there. Yes. They are ready to publish the if they're research right? papers, we are ready to publish those as well. And there are several for proceedings somewhere. Yeah. There. Conference there proceedings. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Personal, books, uh, yes, Personal books as well. Yeah. So in philosophy, like I have two, three proposals on Advaita Vedanta that we're bringing out this year. So they are coming up. <laughs> I mean, just not this year, next month. So yeah. And. Um, yeah, so basically we were there at the World Book Fair, New Delhi World Book Fair also. Atlantic was there and we had a really good time. <laughs> um, we were at the front, hall number five. So yeah. Any other questions, I can answer them. And uh, we have a catalog here. I've gotten extra copies for new releases. You can also check them out. Yes. Yeah, so we'll ask the sales team to share catalogs, our own publication catalogs. They already are in touch with the library. 
I only have three. I didn't bring ten fifty. But I can I can share it online. Yeah, I can yeah I can send this off. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah, you can take one hard copy. We have got three, so you can take one. Um, and uh, yeah. And also, I'll have my uh, assistant editor to give all the cards. And I'll share the PDF of the catalog with Professor Kumar. Yes, for sure. Yes. Yeah. They're not here. They're going to come next year. So this is 2023 catalog. They are not here. But they are, they are by one uh, um, B.A. Prasanna. Um, he has um, worked, he has, he has done his M, uh, master's from IIT and then he went on to become a brahmachari and had written Advaita Vedanta. So we have two books. Advaita Vedanta ka transactional analysis pe bhi hai. So that is what we're bringing out next year, ne uh, next month. Those are not here. Uh, but because we're going to be revising the catalog, so next month, uh, within six months, you will revise the catalog. That will send. The, I'm going to give my card. So it's, I'll, yeah. So very much interested in the new research as well. Uh, we would like to publish those. So please reach out for that. Okay. Thank and you, man. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for coming. Yes, today. thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to the textbook. So, yeah. Okay, so we start with the last session. I invite. Ah, uh, uh, that don't worry. So uh, I will starting with the last session. So I invite Dr. Subhashini Barik and uh, Dr. Monica Prabhakar to speak about the teaching of logic. Logic is a discipline with which probably all of you are familiar and I guess there shouldn't be any problem as far as Aristotelian logic is concerned because the syllabus wise I guess it is, I mean we are comfortable teaching it, it's not much of a syllabus, there are only three units uh, and um, but the problem comes uh, when um, we have to actually uh, teach and evaluate. So while evaluating, I uh, witnessed a few things which I will share with you. So uh, since I don't have much to speak about, uh, about um, the syllabus, because as I said, it's not too long. Uh, it, it is covered by well chance, in time. By chance, three minutes. By chance. By chance. Yeah. So initially it was. We all know that logic is quite popular among students. Um, popular probably because it's a very scoring paper. So in the first classes itself, we tell students that you must study logic. It's very scoring. You are going to enjoy it. And they do enjoy it. That's not, uh, I mean, doubtful that they do not enjoy it. It's, it's an interesting paper, of course. But actually, um, I want to stress on the purpose also, as in why we study logic. We all know that we are, you know, we humans by nature are logical and uh, all our thinking and the activities in which we are involved, they too are logical. And um, um, why do I say that, that uh, we are logical? Because, uh, you know, we are driven by procedures. All our thinking, all our activities, they are, you know, all procedure-based. And this procedure is logical in nature. Right. So 
Um, and um, the question is, if we are all logical, why do we study logic? When we are logical, what is as a discipline to study But there is, you know, a, a, a reason for studying logic because, you know, all thinking and the activities that we do, whether it is pottery making, whether it is, you know, repairing something, cooking, or anything, right? It, it, it has a, uh, all these activities, in, and as I said, including our thinking, there is a common structure to all these. And, uh, you know, the formal dimension of uh, this structure constitutes the subject matter of logic as a discipline, right? We can, uh, you know, understand this by way of an analogy. Uh, see, practicing yoga leads to uh, a healthy uh, mental and physical balance, right? And thereby it reduces stress, tension, anxiety, and which is why, you know, our doctors prescribe or rather suggest yoga to all of us. Now, uh, those who take up yoga as, as a practice, right, they um, need not acquire uh, the neurological understanding of, um, of uh, you know, how yoga uh, leads to calmness, right? Um, they simply need to practice yoga. Bas utna hi kaam hai. Yoga karna hai to yoga kiya. Similarly, aisi situation logic may be. Hai. We are all logical in nature, right? Now, why do we need a formal course on logic? Is it going to make us more logical? Aisa nahi hai, right? Uh, studying logic is not a requisite for being logical. However, if we delve into formal logic, then we can recognize when we make errors, and we can learn how we can amend um, our reasoning. So, um, when we take um, yoga classes or take up yoga as a subject of inquiry, rather, subject of inquiry, when we study yoga sutra or yoga, we are not so much concerned with those who do yoga or how they do yoga, how they are doing yoga. We just study the anatomy of yoga. Now, similarly, when we take up logic as a subject, we are not so much concerned with, not so much, not so much concerned with uh, observing how uh, people are uh, being logical or when are they making mistakes. Rather, we focus on the anatomy of human reasoning. And when I say anatomy of human reasoning, I mean, or, or rather I stress, I, uh, I refer to the rules of inference, right, which, are, uh, which are, you know, embedded in our mind. And we learn how these rules can be formally employed to, uh, uh, to, to determine the uh, correctness of our reasoning. Uh, more spe uh, specifically, the central uh, concern of logic is, as we all know, validity, invalidity. That is all fine. But um, I think the, uh, the way uh, a teacher should address uh, logic, I guess, uh, the best is to involve students into the activity of doing logic. Yeah, because otherwise it's very theoretical. One has to involve, I mean, people have to involve students into the activity of logic, and that is very important. And for that, you, we need to start with simple, simple examples, simple methods, and then move on to the complex um, uh, examples, and then to the complex methods. So, uh, as far as the syllabus goes, I think uh, the first unit is, is all uh, theoretical, I guess, in which uh, there is comparison between deductive, inductive, and discussion on uh, 
Yeah, sentence proposition validity, truth and validity. So I, I don't think there should, there is any problem regarding that. We have been doing uh, teaching that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, yeah, um, yeah, this is what I was going to discuss. Why evaluation? She meant declarative sentence. <laughs> declarative sentence. No, no. Ah, okay. No, we are talking about declarative sentences. Hmm. Uh -huh. More marks are given, classes are less, time is less. So how much you can spend, uh, teach them and how much they are receiving, accordingly they will write in the answer. <laughs> okay, so I have the syllabus with me. As I can see, uh, the first unit is uh, the basic concepts of logic and uh, I have, um, I guess, um, there are three topics under this unit. Then the second unit is uh, traditional logic, which includes categorical propositions, which talk about um, quality, quantity, and distribution of terms. I don't think there should be any problem regarding this. Then the traditional square of opposition, including existential import. Then immediate inferences, including conversion of version contraposition. Yeah, there is a problem. See, when we evaluate these uh, papers, uh, there, there are different ways in which students answer these questions. So we do not really know how to evaluate, how to give marks. Some have actually, you know, uh, given a long procedure, uh, you know, uh, there is a method to answer. Because, you know, while you are studying logic, you are working within a system. So if you follow the system, if you're following the system, then, you know, you, you really want to give marks to students. But sometimes students just, just, you know, give an answer without even explaining why, uh, you know, the answer is so and so. So what to do in those situations? So there are teachers who give marks uh, in those, uh, you know, to those answers, but there are others who, you know, restrain from giving marks, you know, as far as such answers are concerned. So there has to be uniformity, I guess. Um, yeah. No, 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 no. It depends on the question. I am just like a contraposition. They have just a contraposition. They have not told steps. So what do you do in that? It's a logic. It's a logic. Exactly, ये सोचना पड़ेगा। तो So then what do we need to do? This is what we need to decide now. Yeah. So if you tell the whole steps, then you have to give two numbers, or if you have to write an answer in one line, then you can also give the number.
नहीं पर मुझे ये पूछना है कि टीचर ऐसा पढ़ाते हैं या बच्चे अपनी मर्जी से ऐसा कर रहे हैं नहीं तो जैसा पढ़ाया जाएगा वैसे भी तो करेंगे या सो सिंस मेरा टेक ये है सिंस कॉपी इज द प्रिस्क्राइब टेक्स्ट सो वी शुड फॉलो कॉपी नहीं नहीं सारे रूल्स क्यों लिखने हैं नहीं 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 सिर्फ द स्पेसिफिक रूल विच इज ब्रोकन हाँ नहीं नहीं बट देखो इफ द क्वेश्चन डिमांड्स कि आप रूल बताइए जो ब्रेक हुआ है द स्टूडेंट इज नॉट एक्सपेक्टेड टू लिस्ट ऑल द रूल्स दैट आर नॉट इवन ब्रोकन अच्छा और वेन डायग्राम में भी प्रॉब्लम है वो सिर्फ डायग्राम बना के खत्म कर देते हैं दे डू नॉट गिव द रीजन क्या शेड मतलब वो जो हम बताते हैं ना मिडल टर्म्स और माइनर मेजर वो पूरा बताया जाता है हाँ तो एग्जैक्टली exactly, तो फिर फिर उसमें हम क्या फुल मार्क्स दें नहीं दें कैसे करें हाँ तो वो वो तुक्का भी लगा देते हैं हाँ ओके पर एक्चुअली क्या है कि इस सेमेस्टर में कोई वो पेपर पढ़ा रहा है नेक्स्ट में नहीं पढ़ा रहा तो फिर उसको पता नहीं चलेगा हाँ हाँ जी नहीं पर आप आप अगर कॉपी फॉलो कर रहे हो तो उस नहीं पर फिर देर इज नो डिसीजन टेकन ओके तो माय सजेशन इज दैट सिंस कॉपी इज अ प्रिस्क्राइब टेक्स्ट वी शुड फॉलो कॉपी ओनली दैट्स इट बिकॉज इट्स अ सिस्टम इट्स अ प्रोसीजर वी कांट एस्केप इट और शुड अवॉइड इट एग्जैक्टली सो प्रिस्क्राइब टेक्स्ट को थोड़ा रिस्पेक्ट मिलना चाहिए बट दैट्स अ सेकेंडरी रीडिंग तो वो हेल्प के लिए ली जा सकती है दैट कैन बी कंसल्ट बट दैट शुड नॉट बी फॉलोड आई आई गेस दैट्स ऑल दैट आई वॉन्टेड टू डिस्कस क्या हुआ थैंक यू सो मच
I really appreciate all my friends, colleagues, waiting for such a long time. And last discourse, last discussion is on logic, which is really a... Uh, <laughs> 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 logic for the first time and they are going to be introduced to functional logic and that topic starts with compound statements. I think logic of compound propositions. That is the title given over here where it is really difficult for the beginners where I would suggest few corrections here. Uh, that uh, some topics should be added here so that these new students for which motive they are being studied, they are being uh, given this paper should be uh, solved. That is the logical reasoning skill which is a uh, quite requirement in every competitive examination. They should be acquainted with what sentence is and what logical sentence is. They should know that. What is a deductive argument and what is an inductive argument? What is formal logic and what is informal logic? Or for that matter, they should learn what are the basic principles of logic which is never been taught anywhere in introduction of logic, which are laws of identity, laws of contradiction, and laws of excluded middle. These three components of logic should be introduced here so that we may not change that particular part which has been taught during major and honor students and will be added here and these students can be learn how to apply logic in their day to day life because it is not it, is, it was earlier but right now it is not there so I would suggest I would suggest these components should be added in unit 1 and unit 4 should be totally eliminated because of the constraint of time. Quantitative, uh, quantification theory is not that relevant for these level students. At least later on they can go for any advanced logic and that can be uh, eliminated from the whole syllabus so that it can be a review and right now we can think about, about this. This is first problem because this is a though we are teaching them and we had discussed also in a uh, in one group of hours. So these are must for this. Second thing which I am saying uh, regarding the pedagogy uh, part, we need to manage our students to learn logic along with illustrations. When truth functional logic, truth functional logic means they are introduced symbols, symbolic logic, how to apply. So they should be know, they should know what is what are the limitations of traditional logic and why this truth functional logic or symbolic logic is necessary 
uh, for their life. They are, in the syllabus itself, they are being introduced to rules of replacement and rules of uh, inference, both the rules are, uh, uh, I mean, required. Once they are introduced the principles of logic and they are, and here teacher's role will be little bit uh, difficult because we need to, I feel, I always feel a, an enriched introduction is happy work done. Agar hum logic kya kisi bhi subject mein bahut achha ek introduction de dete hain, then aadhe kam because we need to, you, we need to enter into the mindset of our students so that they can feel the relevance or importance of the subject matter so that they can come to our classroom. So here we need to involve them into the current affairs, into the day-to-day -day life, taking illustrations and asking them to formulate the arguments out of that. So where they can get involvement, what is a sentence and how we are deriving a proposition. So that argument, that premise and argument, uh, conclusion, formulation can be learned by them and they can also learn how to use, apply this logic into day-to-day -day life. So this is how, because logic is very abstract and using that in day-to-day -day life, this is how they can learn. And that is how interaction can be, make more relevant and we can go for continuous assessment. Here also, I think few informal fallacies can be discussed, like smaller fallacies which everyday life we are using, like Petitio Principi, like complex question, smaller, which they can, they can uh, connect logic with day-to-day -day life, how dilemma is coming, hypothetical, the uh, 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 principle of replacement and principle of inference while we are asking them to use the formulas if we are making them used with modus ponens modus tollens ya commutation i mean formula of commutation ya association for that matter if i am going for identity even so they can apply these formulas in their day to day life where they can feel the necessity of logic in application part and which will be little interesting one and they can use the logical, they can learn and use the logical reasoning skill. These are few suggestions and so far as truth functional logic is concerned here, methodology because this is a, uh, this was in honors course. It was never in program course. Right now it is in program course. So one workshop is required here so that every teacher should the way uh, uh, my previous uh, resource person was speaking, uniform teaching is required because while evaluation, we are doing evaluation, you could see how students are doing and all the students are doing in a similar manner. That is the reason we can see that maybe it is a mistake, maybe it is a mistake on part of uh, teacher and nowadays our students are very smart, they are not coming to the class, they are using internet. Google search se oh, logic pad rahe or wahi uh, different kind of symbols they are using in the evaluation, uh, examination sheet. So these are few things we need to take care of little bit, uh, we need to follow copy that should be the uh, minimum symbolic logic symbolic logic as well as introduction to logic both the books need to be referred because truth functional logic we need to take care of the symbolic logic part also so these are uh, two three things in case we are taking care of and i would request all my friends to prepare some question bank banks so that the logic part can be easily be covered and managed by all the college and students will get attracted to this class and this is a, always I say it is a hundred percent scoring paper and once they'll get used to different kind of questions 
there should be subjective pure subjective or pure objective questions two patterns of questions should be there for truth functional logic so that they can score good marks i mean percentage will be very high and they will that is the major aspect for getting this paper so more students will be attracted so these are few suggestions for truth functional logic because many things are there these are all mathematical uh, the the uh, whether it is uh, formal proof of validity whether it is uh, uh, theory of conditional proof derivational rules these are all these things symbolization and translation these are all i am not going to because it is a part of all truth functional logic here there is no problem but methodology should be uniform so that students whenever they are doing it they should take care of the and one major thing in logic steps are equally important when you are doing the truth table or formal proof of validity or derivation theory every bit of step is relevant the answer is not relevant if student is doing a wrong step then the mark will be deducted from there but finally the answer is correct the steps are wrong they are also wrong and even if the result is wrong steps are correct they should be given proper mark so this is where a teacher need to be very 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 focused and these part need to be taken care of in our classroom so that everything will get managed One continuous ablo sir could be and here uh, for question bank uh, uh, question bank i would request everyone every college is having this paper because we have either ba program or honors zarurat hai continuous option in addition to this because i am sitting in department and addressing the nap nep issue i would request professor kesav and uh, dr nilanjan to take care of the skill enhancement paper that is logical reasoning which is very important every every uh, competitive examination is having one paper on logical reasoning skill and our students are not being oriented accordingly because the way we are teaching the way we are questioning is not the kind of question they are having in competitive examination they are different so there should be a skill enhancement paper which is required this is available in cat mat any competitive examination every examination is having logical reasoning skill so it should be there and we should make a demand from this department side so that we will have otherwise we can ready we are ready to meet the vice chancellor even because i have already no they have already twice they have made this demand but it has been rejected no no actually uh, college teachers should uh, uh, should go and meet for this because actually, undergraduate students no <laughs> and this paper is equally relevant नहीं नहीं 
now we should make this uh, demand to the university because this is a paper which is equ equally important for all competitive examination. Once it will be split as a sec paper, all kind of students can join for this paper, and our workload will be a. हाँ वही तो मैं कह रही हूँ No, actually the person in charge is not convinced with the arguments made by department people. That is the reason we uh, college people should go and meet her. That is the only solution what I think. This is all I wanted to okay, so discuss. Uh, Thank you. First of all, my greetings to the chair and to the faculty members. And uh, I'm very thankful to Professor Kesha Kumar for conducting this workshop on and giving us a chance to reflect upon curriculum and pedagogy and quality assurance in terms of the different uh, aspects and the papers of the philosophy. So I was here to just uh, initiate the discussion on philosophy of religion in order to analyze the outcomes, difficulties and suggestions for quality assurance of the philosophy of religion paper, which is being taught in different semesters under the UGCF curriculum for BA honors, BA program major and minor, generic electives and SDSC. Yeah, philosophy of religion taught in BA honors, semester six, and uh, DSC also, BA program philosophy as major, semester six. And uh, this is the paper, Philosophies Understanding Religion. And with this, independently religions are taught in generic electives, in semester two, engaged Buddhism, semester five, Sikhism. And if we consider Sufism also, it is there. So basically the aim of the NEP is uh, the expected aims of the philosophy of religion paper was set to familiarize the students with basic arguments regarding religion that the philosophy is presented and to comprehend the complications involved in choosing between faith and reason that will develop to have better appreciation to religious life. To an extent, aims are followed but in evolve with certain difficulties faced both by teachers and the students in realizing the goals of it. First of all, uh, means I, I try to explain what I have evolved with and later I will come to the things that we discussed here. For a teacher of philosophy of religion, it is difficult to philosophize religious concepts to make understand undergrad students because the expectation of the students to have an understanding of the concepts entailed in different religious tradition. So what, what is the problem is that they are considering philosophy of religion is equal to religion and religion is equals to spirituality. So that distinction is not being come out of that curriculum or the syllabus that we have on philosophy of religion or any other paper itself. So, so that it would help them in understanding and making decisions about the current issues um, and their importance that may be in regard with any religion as matter of practice. It is an expectation of students seeking philosophy of religion as it may relate ideas, concepts and arguments in discussion with their lives. So nowadays what is the main issue what I have seen that as this NEP is student centric and students are seeking answers to uh, answers in regard with the philosophical questions uh, so that they can relate it with their lives and that can help in making 
the decisions or to reflect upon the practical issues of our life. So it is an, uh, therefore in present time there is a need to see subject from a different perspective focusing on religious traditions. However, due to constraints of time, studying this paper in semester mode with less lecture hours is not able to create an in-depth in understanding of concepts and arguments in students which is essentially for complete knowledge. Means we have exhaustive articles are there in terms of proofs of God and one more problem that uh, I have seen in this syllabus is that that anyhow from Indian perspective or from the Western perspective there it is trying to establish the, pro the existence of God. So there are the certain students who are objecting and questioning that why we should, we should consider that there is God, <coughs> isn't it? So in, that, in those logical understandings we need to discover something more in regard with this syllabus. There is also a gap which occurs in understanding philosophy of religion and its relation with religion and theology. So there are, so first of all I think there is a need, in, need an introduction, a conceptual introduction that can give a distinction between philosophy of religion, religion, spirituality and theology. Okay. Yeah. No, it should be there. It should be there. It is there, but it is not reflecting as it is required. It is not, it is not a comparative one. It is, it is just explaining in its own domain. Huh. Yeah, so spirituality is not there, but in, in present scenario, we are looking religion from the spiritual end. So that is, no, no, that we know, <laughs> that we know, no, 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 that we know, but, but the student are coming with that kind of misconception. Yeah, so that misconception has to be removed has to be addressed. So you mean there has to be some, some section of Yeah, section? yeah. In introduction itself, we should have a kind, and moreover, what I have seen from the lectures itself, that we should develop a manual where we can um, introduce the terms related with the philosophy, different papers of the philosophy, as well as uh, the teaching methods, because we are not trained how to teach how to address the undergrad students. So for that, for the uniformity purpose, I think that should be there because if some methods are being prescribed, if one or other method, the teacher can adopt and, and in that sense, in, we can maintain the uniformity. Then we come to the quality assurance. So, uh, but anyhow, now, now what presently we are doing, it is on the jurisdiction of the teacher herself to decide that how she can convince the students in terms of any principle or idea to set it, isn't it? So in that regard, we, we, need, we need to systematize all this teaching methods. So in this sense, uh, the curriculum is given and the curriculum is being given with due discussion and but still there is always a scope of uh, improving it and revising it. And in terms of pedagogy, it is as we are not trained. So for that, it is up to the teacher to decide that how to, how she can teach and how she can convince or how she can uh, formulate her teaching in a way that can uh, make them understand the concept, ideas and how uh, she can, uh, uh, main, main challenging thing is that, that we are having the diverse questions. Questioning is diverse because Students are coming from diverse background. Okay, yesterday only in a class of theories of consciousness, the girl was asking that I am coming from the tribal background, from Assam itself. I am not able to understand that how I will go with philosophy, how I will deal it. So according to you, what is the major question the students are asking in the classroom? That what is, which is the best philosophy that we should follow? Hmm. So these are the questions which are, uh, what I can say, depends upon the individual teacher's intellectual vigor to decide. Yeah. So 
deconditioning can be possible only when we are able to succeed in uh, in our aim to explain them that what actually the thing is because nowadays what happened dharma is there religion is there they don't understand the meaning exactly and they start debating and talking on the issues we have seen on the um, social media we have seen on uh, the different channels also the experts came but they don't know what the religion is actually what are its uh, principles and ideas and the concepts even the terminology is not clear to them but they are debating so Maybe this is ritualism is also considered as a spiritual yeah. like religion so all these spiritual. things has to be discussed there should be an introduction yes. before every paper what i feel because every paper has its own terminology so there should be uh, there should be something hmm so then uh, in terms of uh, quality assurance so quality is always be in terms of uh, that how the students is student is prepare for the society i think the in that manner we can maintain or assure the quality so we should address all those issues in relevance with the philosophical principles and ideas and theories so that they can utilize or they can reflect upon or they can make a judgment over this that how they can lead their life to make it better and this paper is both indian and western yeah it is indian and western both so, so they are more confused <laughs> yeah yeah our aim is the compare and contrasting but they become doubt uh, they become confused so in terms of quality of assurance i have means uh, i'm just pinning pin point out the issues only not going to in deep of it because we have already uh, heard 17 speakers over it <laughs> and exhausted indian yeah we should have a religious studies separately then the philosophy of religion so that we can come to understand that there is a difference Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. And we are teaching even like like uh, Jainism principle of Santhara. We are teaching in medical ethics. Mm -hmm. We are teaching the art of Hinduism in some other DSC. Yeah. Mm? And we are teaching Hindutva in some other G. So it's like that. It is all scattered. No, it's not a G, but it is one of the topic in one of the G. I have gone through all the syllabus and I try to find locate it the related religion issues I I will tell you I just missed that thing I'll tell you I have noted down So now I just uh, so uh, so the basic questions in terms of pedagogy that comes from the student is what is the best philosophy or religion Ma'am which philosophy you are ma'am which philosophy No, no, no. But we need to answer it. There is no as such, ha. Huh? But we need to answer it. Such questions. So there should be some deliberation at the end of the means manual also. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And already with five lectures in LOCF, we fel we feel that there is a time constraint. and now it become timeless <laughs> because three lectures one tutorial does not suffice anything neither to the uh, student nor to the teacher herself because now we need to change our uh, approach towards uh, teaching the paper also we uh, as we are talking here to for prescribing text and translations but are we going to follow that can we follow that time permits us for doing so that is not there so now now we we now no nep wants to make uh, make difference in teaching methods also you have to just go and summarize the thing and come out of it that is the thing and the text is there if they want to study they study so likewise likewise the quality cannot be maintained teaching philosophy teaching philosophy requires the relaxed mind isn't it any reasoning whether it is logic or any other paper is there what we require we require time to understand 
and a relaxed mind peace and it is not there and now nowadays before that only the employees are working 9 to 5 now students are attending the college 9 to 5 yeah. so where there is a time and rest of the time at the home rest of the time at the home they are doing assessment work so there is no scope there is no scope of reflection data collection forever we think at times yeah last minute so the last thing i just want to say in terms of quality assurance uh, in order of modern world for the development of philosophy of religion we need to reaffirm readjust and extend the field of philosophy of religion by making it more relevant the relevance can be enhanced by touching up allied disciplines of history of religions sociology of relevance religious studies etc because philosophy of religion in practical terms cannot be taught with old objectives of epistemology ontology teleology and religious language only but also required to study religious phenomena in its entirety as this field of study is currently very stimulating academicians from various fields like anthropology sociology psychology and history are interested in the topic of religion hence it will be injudicious to stick only with the established form of religion that is christianity in philosophy of uh, philosophy of religion paper the western part is just focusing the christianity principles and their ideas there is yeah they should bring into the consideration so therefore philosophy of religion ought to loosen the old bonds with classical metaphysics christian dogmatics and focus more on the plurality of religions and religiosities that may engage in dialogue with other disciplines and can locate religions in modernity yeah this is my submission thank you everyone just one suggestion that cult ka bhi kar lo because so many religions are yeah. itna cult development ho gaya hai na that we need to actually talk about okay. it talk has to be and the students need to know that they ask questions but they do not know the yeah. answer yeah yeah they know what is called to be aware no they 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 able to do it ha and how it is not philosophy and also i think we should smartly give bsc choices whereby Yeah, philosophy of religion no, and no, religious no, studies. Ha, uh, Indian theories of consciousness. I am teaching as DSC. Hmm. Putting them together may create a problem because standing committee may object to it. But then they will say, "Ki in me difference kya hai? Ye wo that problem is there." Hmm. Hi, hi. Please go ahead. Oh, something like that can be done. Yeah, that's all yeah. right. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I think before that, we should give them the logic is required to introduce in sec. Hmm. Definitely. <laughs> so one can develop a very interesting course on philosophy of religion for just as a GE, basically. Because we we are deprived of sec any paper. Ah, that's right. Sec. Hmm. सेक में एक भी पेपर नहीं है जो फिलॉसफी पढ़ा सकता है और इसीलिए उसके पास कोई भी सेक पेपर नहीं है फिलॉसफी के पास और इसीलिए वर्कलोड भी कम हो रहा है डॉक्टर बोस यू वांट टू स्पीक अबाउट फेमिनिज्म एंड द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ द बीए प्रोग्राम देखो आई थिंक मच हैज बीन सेड इट इज क्वाइट ग्रेट आल्सो टू थिंग्स दैट आई वांट टू से वंस व्हेन वी वर ट्रेनिंग द एनपी स्ट्रक्चर वी द बेसिक आईडिया वाज आई विल ओनली टॉक अबाउट जी एंड बैक एंड एस Rest, I don't want to talk because it has has already been touched. It's quite late now. Uh, see, the basic idea at that time was to uh, to just kind of you know safeguard our workload. We were thinking of uh, proposing more number of G. But last semester there was a ruling from UGC or from Delhi University. You cannot have more less than twenty students to float up, yes. to float up.
order B or uh, and, and uh, option paper, not for the 4 and the DAC paper. That means to opt for 3344 G's in uh, each semester doesn't make any sense. Hmm. What we have to do, we have to just uh, uh, revisit whatever of that we have opted for. Hmm. The feminism paper which we have opted sometime in uh, fifth semester and sixth semester should come before because political science department is also of offering GE paper and they are offering it in much before us. On so feminism? On feminism. Feminist ah, English department to Feminist study. We are offering the same paper in eight semesters. Ah, right. Yeah. Ah, that's right. That's also a very important thing. That is, that is a very important exercise that we need to do. Okay. And, you know, for the VAT, uh, I have been teaching ethics and culture that has very good acceptance. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, we, I, I think uh, other part of other colleges are also offering that paper. Uh, but ACC definitely we need to. Uh, but then, yes, sir, ACC, next semester, 2025, is Yeah, 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 somebody's ready. So, okay, thank you. Those are very interesting observations, actually. So, I will, uh, the last speaker of the day is uh, Dr. Purushottam. So, he is going to talk about technology and information ethics. Ah, you can see. Uh, everybody is in mood up to go out. The whole day we are uh, intellectually, <coughs> we are exercising intellectually philosophical level. So, <coughs> I am, I must, uh, Thank you for the respective Department of Philosophy, Delhi University, and also many many colleagues are there. Good evening, one and all, and greetings. And I will be talking on the <coughs> technology and ethics, and also information ethics. And I m I have uh, actually, with my limited knowledge, I think Delhi University only offering the information ethics and also technology and that too in the UG UG uh, 
okay, you know, UG level. With my limited knowledge, other <coughs> state, I don't know, but uh, in my so far, even MA level also, but I have gone through all the syllabus, but I must congratulate it. <coughs> the way it has been decided. So it has uh, really, it is very, the James K. Chimur, he was saying that computer ethics is the also intellectually interesting and also enormously important. So, and I, I also quote, <coughs> The Herman Tavani talks about the if philosopher do not confront the conceptual ethical issue on the internet, then who will? So in this way, <coughs> the information ethics also, it is the domain of the moral philosophy, all the things. So <coughs> at the outside, I would like to have, <coughs> before going to the information ethics, first we need to have what is the nature of information and also what is the information ethics and also what are the historical aspect of information ethics and also is information ethics theoretically unique or what are the debates within the information ethics because you know he, when we talk about the, the historical perspective if we look the information ethics we have to trace from the, the historical aspect from the, the computer ethics so and some more some of the things I, I would like to share so that we can have some kind of discussion of course when we talk about information we all are in the information age Information is a power, information is a valuable asset, information is a wealth, information is everything. So in this case also, information also, yes, today we are in a data world also, information is also a great source and power. And sign very quickly. And personal data, personal data is a life led by so the new uh, information we'll economy also. Available so whenever we talk about the natural information also, uh, any other of questions course we I'm need to, we we need to, look, we well. need to look after the, the ethical yes. issues like the privacy, the, the research hacking, papers, we are and the other issue, accuracy, well. you know, the surveillance, yeah. data violence, yeah. and also many other yeah. issues we need to take yeah. into consideration. And I was yeah. going so in philosophy, like I have two, three proposals on Advaita Vedanta that we're bringing out this year. So they are coming up. Information yeah. ethics. I mean, so just when not we talk about month. particular issues, we can use right. debate the method and, uh, so that in order to make them to understand. For example, <coughs> like we can divide the students into two groups, like a pros and cons. Suppose <coughs> if I am in a one group, I can uh, I can argue that yes, information should be free. So on the other hand, information is also free flow of information is also basic democratic. Will. On the other hand, also one can argue, yes, fine, well and good. If the information is free, who is going to pay for it? So other, like many other issues also there, so we have to also look into the, so every, each and every issue, we can use debate uh, by, by, in order to make them to understand the, the real issue and also the, the real problems in a very, uh, you know, meaningful way also. And some more things also, of course, when we talk about the, the information ethics also, we need to look the, from the historical perspective also. Because when we talk about the information ethics also, like, uh, of course, the history concerns the past, education concerns the learning, and also here in this case also, life is the primary good for the information ethics. So in this case also, like, uh, <coughs> information is also, it is a very good for the legitimate